tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The Afterlife Experiment Written by C.K. Walker Narrated by Alicia Pavlis I've always felt a little lost in life, like I never received complete instructions on who I'm supposed to be. Everyone else around me seemed to know exactly who they were. Their lives would fly right by me. Their GPS is locked onto destinations while I just sat idling in the street. In high school, I never did any extracurricular activities because I couldn't figure out if I was a sports person or a music person. I was no different in college. I wandered through four different majors, unable to decide who I wanted to be. I just felt like a blank slate. And if I was a blank slate, Micah York was the starry night, authentic. Beautiful and perfect. He was my antithesis, which is what attracted me to him in the first place. At the same time, I resented him. He was born knowing exactly who he was and what he was about. Micah's self-confidence was an all but tangible element of him. I envy the degree of certainty with which he progressed through life. Micah and I first met in our freshman year of college. He was a neuroscience student and I was majoring in history. We dated briefly our sophomore year, after I changed my major to computer sciences. We broke up the following year, just before I decided to pursue a psychology degree instead. In my senior year, shortly after my advisor informed me that I was too late to switch majors again, Micah came to me asking for a favor. Our final semester of college was quickly approaching and Micah had been applying to grad schools. He wanted to get his master's in neurobiology, and I helped him with the applications when I had time. At the time, Micah was under a lot of stress to nail his senior thesis. For this reason, I found it peculiar when he announced he was throwing a party in January. Micah was a meticulous student, and he didn't throw parties. Ever. In spite of my misgivings, my interest was piqued. When Micah offered me an invitation, I accepted. When I arrived at Micah's off-campus apartment the night of the event, I hesitated before getting out of the car. His apartment was dark and quiet. There was definitely no party. I couldn't help but wonder what he was up to. I picked up my phone to call him, ready to tell him I'd changed my mind, but curiosity suddenly got the better of me and I hung up. Micah's door was unlocked. I let myself in and, hearing voices coming from the living room, headed in that direction. When I arrived, I found four people waiting. I knew two of them. Micah was there, of course, as was his close friend, an organic chemistry major by the name of Sean Nichols. The other two were introduced to me as fellow med student Irina Bradley and as philosophy major Holly Bishop. Irina scooted over and made room for me on the couch. I took a seat and waited for Micah to begin whatever it was he had planned. A moment later he rose and walked to the middle of the room. Thank you all for coming. I'm sure you're wondering why you're here. Clearly, this is no ordinary party. Micah's tone was somber. The truth is, I have something of vital importance to ask each of you. Micah paused, took a deep breath, and dropped his voice an octave. I have selected each of you to take part in the greatest experiment of not only your lives, but perhaps in human history. I am asking you to take part in my doctoral thesis. I rolled my eyes. The presentation was classic Micah. He was many things, 
pretentious, arrogant, and pompous, but no one in their right mind would call Michael York humble. And what exactly is your thesis? I asked nonchalantly, ignoring his melodramatic posturing. A conclusive essay detailing what happens after human death. Irina laughed. Sadly, I knew Micah well enough to know he was being serious. How do you intend to prove anything? I asked. What kind of experiments have you designed? Well, Bridget, he replied. I'm going to kill myself. The room fell quiet, and Micah, mistaking the shocked horror for odd silence, stood a little taller and smiled. <laughs> you can't be serious, I scoffed. Oh, I am. And it's completely reversible. I am going to be the first person in the world to prove or disprove the existence of an afterlife. We, Sean corrected him. Yes, Micah conceded. We. He continued, this paper is going to be our ticket into any university in the world. Wars have been waged for centuries over deities and religions, and we are going to prove what is scientifically correct beyond a shadow of a doubt. I sighed. <laughs> I had heard enough. You're an idiot. I quipped and headed for the door. Irina took my lead and stood to take her leave as well. Micah beat both of us to the exit and begged us to reconsider. Bridget, wait, he pleaded. Please, hear me out before you walk away. I narrowed my eyes at him and shook my head. No, Micah, I said. I'm not interested in killing anyone, not even you. Holly, who had been silent until that moment, chimed in coolly. I'd like to hear how it works. Uh, well, Sean began. I designed the process. It begins with injections of a specialized combination of chemical agents. He registered the look of concern on our faces and sought to reassure us. Don't worry. It's been tested, and it's safe. Tested? Irina cried. On whom? On lo local wildlife. No human trials? I asked. Not yet, but it is safe, Sean said quickly. So then, Irina asked, how does it work? She took a step back toward the couch, intrigued. With a gesture, Micah signaled Sean to continue. I've developed both a poison and a biologic. I call them Romeo and Juliet. Juliet is a poison that kills the body. Romeo is a biological antidote that revives it. Subjects will lie in a state of clinical death for just 30 seconds. Micah cut in. No brain damage, no organ damage. Yes, it is perfectly safe. He will only be dead for a short time. Sean confirmed. So... Flatliners. I glared at Micah. What? Sean asked. Flatliners, I repeated. It's a movie. The characters kill themselves and bring themselves back. As I recall, it didn't work out very well. Micah is obsessed with the film. So he already knows that. That's a Hollywood movie, Micah said dryly. This is legitimate science. No. You're Kiefer Sutherland. I pointed at him. He's Kevin Bacon. I pointed at Sean. And I'm Julia Roberts. That's absurd, Micah said hotly. You're not Julia Roberts, Bridget. She is. He pointed at Holly. Am I Oliver Platt then? Irina asked. No one is Oliver Platt, Micah shouted. Well, if we get to choose, I'd, I'd rather be Oliver Platt than Kevin Bacon. 
Sean interrupted. You're Kevin Bacon, Micah spat. And you're Kiefer Sutherland! I yelled at him. This isn't Flatliners! <sighs> I sighed. I'm not going under. No, Bridget, you're not. Micah looked exasperated. Then why am I here? Micah ran a hand through his dark brown hair. I've been trying to get to that. Am I going under? Irina asked. No. Just me, Sean, and Holly. And you think she's going to agree to that? I asked, incredulous. Actually, Holly interrupted, raising from the couch. I already have. Why? I gaped at her. Because I want to know, need to know, why I'm here. Why any of us are here. I want to know what the soul is and, and where it goes. I want to hold the keys to human existence, love and suffering, life and death. I want to understand our purpose. Plus, I'm getting paid, and it's perfect for my dissertation. That's another thing, Micah said quickly. Everyone will get paid. How much? Irina narrowed her eyes at him. Five hundred dollars each. I groaned. I was short on tuition for the semester by exactly that amount. Micah knew it and intended to take advantage of me. The Romeo and Juliet agents are safe. They've been tried and tested, and they will work. Sean and I have rented a house on Emerald Street to conduct the experiment. All I need, all I'm asking, is for you to show up, Bridget. To show up next Saturday. And what about me? Asked Irina. Irina, I need you to administer the agents and monitor our vital signs. The process will take less than a minute, and afterwards, you and Bridget can both walk away with your $500 and a credit on my thesis. You've got no evidence to support your conclusions, I countered. What makes you so sure everything will go according to plan? The agent Sean developed will be available to anyone and everyone, and they can repeat my experiment at their own leisure. But I don't think that... Please. Bridget, just show up on Saturday. Every facet of Micah's experiment made me profoundly uncomfortable. But the way Micah looked at me, the tension in the room, the $500. Bridget, I'm not asking. Micah grabbed my hands and squeezed. I'm begging. I'll think about it, I said. Micah was cocky, but also undeniably brilliant, in the top one percentile of his class, with several published papers to his name. I couldn't help but wonder, what if the experiment worked? What if he was right? What if he found what he was looking for? Stories of near-death experiences had been reported by people throughout the world for centuries. In his experiment, Micah intended to delve deeper than anyone before, in a controlled environment, in a manner that could be duplicated. The implications were staggering. I arrived at the house on Emerald Street the following Saturday. Curiosity had gotten the best of me in spite of my many reservations. Micah had been expecting me and flashed a smile when he met me at the door. From there, he escorted me to an expansive, sparsely furnished living room. Aside from three cheap-looking twin beds, a few camcorders, and some hospital equipment, the room was empty. Sean and Holly were already laying on two of the beds with nervous smiles in their faces and IVs in their arms. Irina appeared incredibly stressed as she bustled around checking equipment. Micah approached and handed me a heavy, expensive-looking camera. The cameras at the end of our beds are already recording. They're our static cameras. I need you to walk around and record with this one as well. Irina is going to stagger our injections so that she can handle all three of us. 
Your task is to film the experiment and nothing more. Okay, Micah, are you sure you want to do this? Bridget, we've tested this. And as long as Romeo is injected in under a minute, which it will be, there is no risk. There is definitely risk, Micah. Near-death experiences? This isn't a near-death experience, Bridget. It's a near-death experiment. Look, I know you're worried. And that's why I wanted you here. To make sure nothing goes wrong. Even if it does, I have volumes of documentation proving that it was my experiment. Yeah, but... I began to object, but stopped short. I realized I had nothing else to say. Micah would have an answer for any doubts I expressed. That's the way he was. There was no stopping him. I could either bear witness or be elsewhere and simply hear about it. I chose to stay. Micah walked over and stood in front of my camera. It's 12.51 p.m. on Saturday, January 14th. My name is Micah York, and this is the first attempt of the afterlife experiment. Micah walked over to his bed, sat down, and gave a nod to Irina. She found a vein and expertly inserted a needle. When she was finished, Micah reclined and addressed Sean and Holly. Remember to speak directly to your cameras immediately after you regain conscious in order to report your feelings. They both nodded. Okay, everyone, Irina said failing to conceal her trepidation with mock bravado. Everything is ready. All right, Micah said with excitement. Thirty seconds. He turned to Arena. Once the last of the Juliet leaves the tube, you know what to do. Micah pointed to the digital timers at the head of each bed, each of them set to thirty seconds. Irina nodded. Bridget? Are you ready? I nodded. See you on the other side, he told me with a smile. Micah gave Holly and Sean a thumbs up. They returned it and then settled back on their beds. I hit record. Irina picked up three red tubes from a nearby table. Steadying her hands, she quickly injected the first tube into Micah's IV. His heart rate monitor flatlined instantly. I flinched as the abrupt squeal caught me by surprise. While I attempted to steady the camera, Irina hit the timer above Micah's bed, hurriedly moved over to Sean, and did the same for him, and then Holly. Irina put her hands over her ears in a futile bid to muffle the discordant shriek of the three EKG machines. Get this! She called to me. Bridget, record this! She pointed to Micah's EEG, which displayed zero active brainwaves. Get Holly and Sean's, too! I began to panic. The experiment was a bad idea, a very bad idea. I returned my gaze to Micah's timer, which had just eight seconds remaining on it. Arena had already prepared the green tube containing the Romeo Biologic and was on standby, ready to inject Micah with it. The cacophonous squeal of the EKG machines was deafening. Each high-pitched beep seemed to scream. Do something! Do it now! Why are you just standing there? Save them! Just when I thought I couldn't stand any more suspense, a different alarm buzzed. Irina wasted no time injecting Micah with the antidote. I waited with bated breath for Micah's vital monitors to show signs of life. Less than five seconds later, his EKG monitor registered one spike, and then another. Moments later, Micah's EEG machine flared to life as well. I exhaled. Irina stepped over to Sean to prepare the injection of his dose of Romeo. When Micah suddenly shot up in bed, eyes wide, and opened his mouth. I was so excited and curious that I, I almost forgot to hold the camera up. I couldn't wait to hear what he had to say. But Micah didn't say anything. He screamed. The suddenness and force of it, the most blood-curdling scream thing I had ever heard, caught me off guard, and I, I, I stumbled backwards into a wall and, and dropped the camcorder. Then Sean started screaming. Micah ignored everyone else and flung himself out of his bed. 
Before Arena and I had any idea what was happening, he began smashing his head against the hardwood floor, connecting with the hard oak over and over again. Beside him, Sean jumped terror-stricken out of bed, knocking Arena out of the way in the process and ran to a nearby wall. He stopped an inch or two from it and shrieked in its direction. Not at the wall, but through it, oblivious to his surroundings. What happened? I begged. What did you see? My shock gave way to hysteria as Micah quickly became less recognizable with every sickening crunch of his skull against the floorboards. By then I had long abandoned any efforts to document the calamity along with the camcorder. Arena, help me! I cried. Arena, who hadn't moved since Sean had knocked her out of the way, stared at me wide-eyed. We need to get him off the floor! He's hurting himself! She opened her palm and looked down at the one remaining tube of the Romeo Biologic as if she'd never seen it before. You didn't give that to her yet? I shrieked wildly. Give that to Holly, now! I rushed to Micah and held him in my arms. All the while he continued to howl uncontrollably, smashing his head against a floor which was no longer there. The combined effect of he and Sean's ear-splitting, torturous screaming and the look of horror on Micah's face, his mouth forever open in a wide O, nearly drove me to tears. Meanwhile, Irina, blinded by the tears streaming from her own eyes, frantically performed chest compressions on Holly. It was too late. Holly was lost. Irina, I called. Irina, call 911. She ignored me, or hadn't heard me, and continued working on Holly. I let go of Micah briefly to grab my phone. Before I could stop him, he took off, running toward the front door. M Micah, stop! I shouted. A moment later, he smashed head first into the glass. If Sean noticed the commotion, he didn't show it. He only screamed those piercing, horrible screams. Emergency services couldn't hear me on the phone, but they had someone at the house within five minutes. A very, very long five minutes. Irina gave up on Holly at some point and resigned herself to pacing around the room mumbling. I don't, I don't understand. I did it right. I don't understand. The first responders took Sean, Holly, and Micah away in an ambulance, and they took me and Arena to the police station. They watched the videos. I never graduated, but I managed to avoid jail time. Arena was not so fortunate. After her trial and conviction, I retreated into myself and refused to speak to anyone. I spent months holed up in my apartment asking the same question over and over. What did they see? It's not as if I could ask them. Sean screamed until he lost the use of his voice permanently and was later admitted to a mental health facility where he faces one of the walls in his room with his mouth wide open as if he was screaming. Somehow, it's worse than if he actually was screaming. Sean hasn't said or written a word since the day of the experiment. Mike has been institutionalized as well. Sometimes he screams and sometimes he's quiet. Sometimes he thrashes, and sometimes he lies as still as the dead. I visited both he and Sean many times, begging them to tell me what they saw. My efforts were fruitless until my most recent visit. When I last visited Micah, he was in one of his screaming phases. I sat with him and let him scream, waiting to see if he would transition to one of his catatonic stages so that I could speak. When I was tired of waiting, I leaned in close to his ear and asked him, Micah! What did you see? His screaming slowly morphed into an insane, uncontrollable laughter, the likes of which I had never heard before. His doctor, who'd been just outside the room, came running in. What did you do? He asked, alarmed. I, I just asked him a question, I responded quietly. What was the question? I, I asked him what he saw. We both noticed the sudden silence at the same time. We slowly turned toward Micah to find him facing us, expressionless. It's all waiting for you, he said slowly. It's waiting for all of us.
His mouth fell open into a large O, and the laughter slowly began again, followed by shrill, horrible screams. I immediately regretted my decision to visit and left the hospital in tears, wishing I'd never met Micah. As I drove home, however, I couldn't help but continue to wonder, what did they see? What's on the other side? Do I even want to know? But I... I suppose it really doesn't matter anymore. Someday I'll find out. And so will you. It's only a matter of time. Before the wait is over. From author Drew Stepick, I give you A Little Bit Country. I walked into that office and wiped some dirt and sweat off of my head with my arm. The office was as wide as a laundromat, with one desk and two chairs in front of it. A fat man in glasses with a pencil behind his ear stood up and started clapping his flabby old hands. He was sweating. And his face was all red. I was sweating too, so I didn't pay it no bother. He had long hair pulled back in a ponytail, like a girl, and one of them funny beards. I think people called him Van Dykes. There he is, he shouted across that room. I stopped dead in my tracks. It was the first voice I'd heard since, uh, well, I can't even remember nothing. Uh, since I've been there, that's for damn sure. Well, the fat man badgered me. Are you going to close the fucking door and come in? Were you born in a barn? I looked back outside the office as I gripped on that door handle. There was nothing but black behind me. I sniffed my nose and cracked my old neck. Jesus Christ, son, he hollered. We have a lot to get to. I jiggled at the handle a bit and then closed it, as I was told. Well, where am I? I asked him. Come on over here and take a seat. He pointed at one of them chairs in front of his desk. We have a lot to get through before I can send you out. I shuffled my dirty bare feet over toward him. Send me out where? I asked him. Am I going somewhere? He pointed at the chair in the left in front of his desk. You've been brought up to the big league, son. Didn't anyone brief you? He picked up his phone and pushed a flashing button. Phillips! He howled. What the fuck is going on? He waited a second and then rolled them bulgy eyes of his. Didn't anyone educate number? He shuffled his hands around the stacks of papers on his desk and pulled out a folder. They opened it and dragged his finger down that page. Number 25-616232285972351 uh? I got him in the office now! Look at me and he doesn't know where he is! He covered the phone with his hand. Ah, fucking processing. Heads are gonna roll, that's for sure. He pointed to that left seat again. Why don't you take a seat while I get your paperwork all situated? I'm just fine standing right here, I told him. He waved me away like a bumblebee and took his hand off that phone. What do you mean he hasn't been processed yet? Did he at least get his orientation? He covered up the phone again and asked, Did you have your orientation yet? I didn't remember getting no orientation, so I said, I don't know. He slapped himself on the forehead. Okay, Phillips. He don't know. Ask Thompson what I should do. He pointedly pulled the phone away from his ear and pointed to it. Hold music. Oh, it's just the worst. He rocked back in that chair of his and put his arms behind his fat old head. His armpits were drenched like he just got sprayed with a garden hose. He pulled that phone back to his ear and listened. He let out a big gust of wind and pulled out that pencil from behind his ear. Started writing stuff on that folder. Okay, he said. Okay. Wait. What? He snapped the pencil in half. What do you mean I have to do it? 
I'm his handler. He should already be prepped and ready to go. God damn it, Phillips. He's supposed to go out today. He started beating that phone against his head. Not hard like. I think he was just making a point. Do you really expect me to believe that the processing department is short-staffed? We're in fucking hell! There are zillions of people down here. He waited a second and listened to Phillips. Oh, don't worry. The IT will hear about this. He put his hand over the phone and looked at me. Can you believe this guy? Then he pulled it right back to that face of his. Fuck me. Fuck you, Phillips! He slammed the phone back onto its butt. He put his hands over his sweaty lady haircut and started laughing like a mental patient. Oh, excuse me, mister. I tried to get his attention. What in the heck am I doing here? He peeked out behind them hands and took a deep breath. Then, he opened up that folder. Come on over here and take a seat. He pointed at that left chair. I limped on over. Seemed like I'd been walking forever and my legs hurt. Pulled that chair out from his desk. I haven't sat down in a long time, mister. He picked up some glasses and went back to the folder. Hmm. It's not like sitting is something you have to learn how to do. He looked up at me. Just joke, son. Then, he looked back down at that there folder again. Yep. Looks like you have been walking for a long time. He took him glasses off. How long do you think you've been down there? I brushed off the seat on that chair. Well, I, I don't know. It seems like forever. He smiled at me. You don't need to tell me I've been there. Thing is that there is no time in hell. It's just, um, here. I bent down to take that seat and then fell right onto my ass. That chair wasn't even there at all. He shot out of his seat and shouted, BAM! <laughs> that never gets old. You trying to hoodwink me, mister? I looked behind me to see who pulled it away before I tried to sit in it. I think no one was there. The chair weren't even there no more. He started screaming and laughing and pounding his fists on the desk. So classic. So classic! I rubbed my legs in my butt. They sure did hurt. Where'd that chair go? Why in the hell would y'all do that to me? He stopped laughing for a second and then looked behind him like I wasn't talking to him at all. Then, he turned back to me and looked at me like he didn't know whether to check his watch or scratch his ass. Y'all? He turned around again. I'm the only one here. He took a seat and then went back to that folder. Oh, here we go. He thumped on that folder with his finger. You're from the American South. Duh. I got back to my feet and brushed off the backs of my legs. I guess so. I don't remember much. He snapped his fingers and that chair came right back up behind me like some kind of magic trick. No one remembers much about being up there. He pointed at the white ceiling. Take your seat, please, son. I stepped up toward him. Mister, I got a mind to just sit down. I got my laugh for the day. I grabbed the chair by its arms and lowered myself onto the seat. Didn't get swallowed up into thin air this time around. He threw the folder back on the desk. Well, you don't have a name on here other than 225-616-232285972351-9. I was listening to him best I could, but... I was thinking more about how good it felt to sit down. Seemed like I'd really been walking around in them hot old caverns forever. You're the first person I spoke to since I've been here. He looked at me like I was a squirrel on a rat trap and pointed a new pencil at me. I'm gonna call you country. Started looking at my dry hands with my tongue. Why you wanna call me that? He started making fun of the way I talked. Well, you're a little bit country. Being a southern gentleman and all, who? Huh? Besides, I don't want to have to read off that long number every time I want to call you something. Well, I think I want to go back to them caverns now, mister. I told him. He put his elbows down on the desk and looked at me straight. No, I don't think you do. My hands were covered in calluses like I got chicken box from a baseball mitt. I'm trying to look at him best I could. And, um, why is that? 
Jesus, he yelled, and then pushed me some lotion on the corner of his desk. Licking your hands is only going to make them worse. I squirted a little bit of the lotion out of the jar and then smelled it. This ain't hot sauce or nothing, is it? Hot sauce? Ha <laughs> ha! Hilarious! He grabbed the bottle and dealt a little bit onto his hands and then lathered them up. That is a good idea, though. I need to remember that one. He stood up. You want something to drink, country? <laughs> Better not be no hot sauce. I warned him. He walked over to a water cooler in the corner that wasn't there a second before. What exactly is your obsession with hot sauce? He poured out some water into a little cup and brought it back to me. I grabbed the cup and sucked it down. Couldn't even remember the last time that I had water. I handed it back to him. Can I have me a little more? He chuckled. You bet, country. He walked back to the water cooler and refilled that cup. You know, you're real lucky. In all my time working as a handler down here, I've never seen anyone make it to agent status so quickly. The IT must have seen something special in you. The IT? I asked. Yeah, the IT. Trust me. He moseyed back to me with my second cup of water. I'm just a lowly handler, and I had to suck the IT's dick and eat the IT's pussy for what seemed like forever. You ain't making no sense. I took the cup and licked at the rim like a bullfrog catching a fly before I drank it down. It was the best darn water I ever did have. The IT is what people up there call the devil, he giggled. Satan? Lord of the Underworld? Mephistopheles? Let me get this straight, mister. The devil is some kind of lady? Didn't you just hear me say that it had a dick, country? Keep up. You ever heard of a lady with a dick? I crunched up the paper cup over my head and tried my damnedest to squeeze every darn drop of water out of it. You also said that the IT had a vagina. The IT has both. He started yapping. I don't know what the fuck I was sucking and eating. You don't ask the IT questions. The bottom line is that I did my time and I got this job. Now... As of today, I work for you. Well, I never heard about nothing like that about dicks and vaginas and all. I also never even met this IT thing. I unfolded the cup and put it down on his desk. I wanted more water, but I didn't want to seem like I was giving him no disrespect. What are we going to be doing? Shoveling pig shit or something? He sat down behind his desk and started giggling. Oh, no, country. Oh, we won't be shoveling pig shit. He pulled open a drawer behind that desk of his and then dropped a bunch of books and folders in front of me. As of today, you are an agent. You will be sent out into the field to manipulate the forces of heaven. Your purpose, well, our purpose, is to break down the followers of God, one at a time. Do what now? I picked up one of them books and flipped through the pages. He smirked and put out his hand to shake mine. Name's Sonny Hooper. You can call me Hoop. I will be your coach and your handler. I looked up from that book, licked my hand, and shook his. You do know how to read, don't you? He asked me. I assume you slept well? Mr. Hooper asked me. He walked over and handed me a big old bottle of water. I pulled some crust off the inside of my nose and sucked that water down. It refilled by itself. Well, I'll be. I figured it was some kind of magic or something. It sure was nice to sleep in a bed, but that fan wasn't really working real well. Country! He dug them flabby hands of his into a bag of potato chips. You're in hell! Do you know how hard it is to get fans down here at all? He waved me over to a new door that appeared behind his desk, over by that water cooler. I followed him. I remember one summer, all them hardware stores in my town were out of fans. That must have been like hell! <laughs> <clears throat> it said in your file that you're from Tupelo, Mississippi, the home of the king. 
like he just turned on a light bulb in a closet, I remembered the king. I remembered Elvis. I liked music. He put out his hand and let me enter that new room before him. I looked inside. It was all white with some kind of computer doohickey and some other type of trough that looked to be hooked up to the computer doohickey. There ain't no tricks in here, is there? Like with that chair? He put up his arms and the flab jiggled in the short sleeved shirt. We don't have time for tricks, country. I walked into that room. He pointed to the computer doohickey. That is the machine that will take you back to the Earth realm. I scuffled over to the trough and bent down to smell it. It wasn't a trough like the tin ones I used to fill on my daddy's farm. At least, I didn't think so. I'm getting out. I looked at them hands of mine. I get to leave? He put his hand over his face. Oh, God, no. You just get to go on a vacation. He walked over to that computer doohickey and pushed a couple of buttons on a typewriter that lit up like a light bright toy. Did you read any of the books or assignments that I gave you yesterday? I walked over to him and looked at the window glass TV screen on top of that computer doohickey. It was too dark to read. I touched that window screen. He swatted my hand away like I was a fly on a hot dog. Don't touch that country! Are you telling me that you don't know how this works? I was getting a little tired of his tone. I said it was dark. He smacked himself on the head. Fuck! That's right. You can't read! I can read! I yelled at him. Uh, I think. Look, it's not that hard. I have sent several agents into the field without understanding the ins and outs of the equipment. He handed me a little June bug looking thing. Put this over your ear. I turned that critter over and hundreds of thousands of legs jiggled round. I didn't much like that bug. It's not going to bite me, is it? Bite you? No! It's an earpiece! So I can communicate with you! He pointed out a microphone coming out of that light bright typewriter in front of the computer doohickey. I talk into that, and you hear me in your ear. I will be watching you from this. He pointed at the window glass TV. That way, I can monitor what you are doing. We can't have you breaking any of the treaty agreements with the guys upstairs. He pointed to that ceiling. I put the bug in my ear. It clamped over the top and the bottom. I felt all thousands of them legs prick into my skin. You mean God? God, Jesus, angels and shit. The other team. Let me make this simple. He pointed to that white trough. You will be in here. Then he walked over to that computer doohickey. I will be watching you from here. You will be doing what I say and playing for our team. It's like football. I like football. I think. I scratched at my ear. The June bug was locked on there pretty tight. It was making me want to sneeze for some reason. What position am I playing? It's not literally football. Mm. You will be taking over the body of a little girl who is presumed possessed. The device in your ear will control your crossing between the realms. He tapped on that June bug thing. I looked at the window glass TV on top of that computer doohickey. It was seeing everything that I was seeing. I waved my hand in front of my face. Huh. This machine. He waved his hand around the room. It's connected to Hell's Core. It allows us to communicate with the Earth Realm through little girls. I didn't much understand what he was saying, so I just acted like I did and nodded my head. Well, little girls, they are the easiest to occupy. For some reason, everyone thinks that when a little girl is sad or starting her period that she is possessed. So, we breach their consciousness when they are easily inhabitable. I could tell you a million stories of all the times that the other team has tried to shut down our operation because we figured that out. That's why there is a treaty in place. We can scare the hell out of anyone we want, but we can't kill anyone from their team. It's become a game of influence. We used to be able to take down whoever we wanted, but uh, the IT has 
kind of a weird relationship with the other team. Remember that. Our job is to outwit them and show the rest of the Earth realm the persuasion of the IT. I looked at Mr. Hooper and then at the TV screen. Remember what? Jesus country! He put one of them hands of his on the microphone and pushed a couple buttons on that light bright typewriter. Phillips! He turned around to look at me and said, Just a second. He turned back to that computer doohickey. I saw the back of his head in that glass window TV. This guy isn't ready. He put his hand over that June bug in his ear. I know that we're short-staffed, asshole. I think we should send him back to the caverns. He doesn't even want to do this. I walked over and tapped him on the shoulder. Mr. Hooper. Hoop. Call me Hoop. He shushed me like we was in a church. Not you, Phillips. I know you know my name. He's talking to me. The dune bug in my ear started to itch some more. Hooper, I don't want to go back to them caverns. What do I got to do? He put up his finger again. Wait, Phillips. It looks like he doesn't want to go back to the caverns. I shook my head and talked into my dune bug. I don't want to go back to them caverns, Mr. Phillips. You heard it from him. Can we send him up to show you that he's ready? Yes. Okay, of course, I'll get him to sign the paperwork. Mr. Hooper stuck up his thumb. I think we're in business. He walked over to the trough and flipped some doodad. Oh, fuck you, Phillips. He smirked and winked at me. You have a better chance of going back to the caverns than my boy country. He waited a second. Oh, yeah. You want to make a wager? <laughs> You're on. He waited another second. Toolshed? Are you fucking kidding me? She's a fucking toolshed? This hick will be a rock star in a toolshed. If country fucks this up, I'll do a thousand years in the caverns. If he does things right... You go back to the caverns. Later, dipshit. He put his hand over his June bug like he was hanging up a telephone. Do, do I gotta go back? I took another drink from the water. Sure did taste good. Mr. Hooper grabbed a stack of papers that was sitting next to the computer doohickey. He handed it to me. You have to sign this now. I looked at the pages but couldn't read nothing. Well, what does it say? That... <clears throat> That's right. You can't read. He grabbed them papers back. I can read. I... I think. He pointed to the first page. This says that you're enlisted in the service of the underworld and that you pledge yourself to the IT. He went to the next page. This says that you will abide by the rules of the treaty, blah, blah, blah. Remember, don't kill any priests, parents, good Christians, people, etc. We don't kill. Our mission is to influence. He flipped through more of them pages. This is the treaty. He flipped through what seemed like a couple of hundred pages and finally he got to that final page. This says that you are choosing not to walk the cabins anymore. And finally, this says that you won't try to escape once you're in the Earth realm. Escape? Yeah, man. If you rip this off, he rubbed on the June bug in my ear. When you're in the Earth realm, you're trapped there. I took a sip of that water. So, I'd be free. No. <laughs> you're not going there yourself. Only a soul. Mm, your brain's going there too. You will be trapped in the body of one of your hosts. Sure, you'll feel all the same pain that your host feels and you'll be able to smell the air and taste the food and all that good shit. But you won't be there. Imagine being in a jail where you can't talk to anyone you see. That sure does sound better than them caverns, I told him. Of course it does. He flicked his fat old finger on that page. Once you sign this, you'll never see the cabins again. I promise. You will be able to drink all the water you want. You will have a bed and a room every night. If you help me win this bet, shit, 
I'll get you a working fan and some lights in your room. He handed me back them papers and a pen. Please help me out, country. In case you didn't hear, I just made a bet with that pederast ass Phillips. Man! Do I hate that guy? He's been trying to steal my job for years. I looked at them papers and grabbed that pen. So, my brain won't hear anymore? He turned back to the computer doohickey. No, your little brain won't be in hell anymore. I don't much like the way you're talking to me again, Mr. Hooper. Fine, he said as he punched away on that light bright typewriter. Big brain, you have a fucking big brain. And I started to sign in papers and then stopped. Wait, what's my name? He didn't turn around. Just sign the contract country. If it can't spell, then just put an X. I'll send it over to Phillips immediately, and he'll process 225-616-232285-9723519. I'll scratch an X on that last page. Mr. Hooper snatched them papers back from me and fed them into his computer doohickey. This should do the trick. Thing is that you need to follow the rules when you're up there, because we're sending you out as an unprocessed agent. We are taking a chance on you, because I believe in you. He waited a minute. I took a gulp of water. Did you get the contract, Phillips? He snapped his fingers at me and pointed toward the trough. Then, he whispered me, Get in. I walked over to that trough. It opened up like a garage door and I looked inside. There was all types of machines and wires inside of it. But there was also a comfortable looking lawn chair in the middle. I pushed my hands up against the back. Sure it was soft. Oh fuck off, Phillips! Mr. Hooper screamed like an alley cat. Be sure and tell the old gang down in the cabins I fucking hate them. He tapped on his dune bug again and then hit a few more times on that light bright typewriter. I dragged my legs over the side of the trough and laid back in the chair. Is uh, this right? Perfect country, now lay back. He walked up behind me and put this thingy that looked like a green bean strainer over my head. It's going to be a bit disorienting when you slip back to the earth realm, but it will get easier the more you do it. He flipped on a switch on the side of that green bean strainer. Are you my boy? I ain't nobody's boy, I told him. He laughed and his fat rolls jiggled near my nose. I know that. You're a badass. You're a soldier. You're a hero. He slapped me on my arm. Tell me the rules now. I stretched out my neck. That chair sure was comfortable. I felt like a pig in shit. Sure it was better than walking around them caverns. Number one, don't tear off this or my brain will be inside a little girl forever. I tapped on that dune bug. He started wheezing away. Perfect. What else? Don't kill no priests or nothing like that. Don't kill anyone, country. Remember the treaty. You have to remember the treaty. If you fuck this up, the IT will get in trouble with God, and then I will be sucking dicks and eating pussies for a long time. Don't kill nobody, I said. Red light started swirling round on top of that window glass TV and a bunch of gravy started filling up inside the trough. Mr. Hooper counted down with them fingers of his. Three. Two. One. Good luck, country. Let's send Phillips back to the caverns where he belongs. Goddamn Yankee, I think he lived in Boston when he was on Earth. I don't think I've ever been to no Boston, but I don't think I'd like it. The top of that trough locked tight like a cigarette holder, and the gravy completely filled it up. Didn't smother me, though, and it didn't taste like no gravy I ever had before. I opened my eyes and spit out that gravy taste, but nothing came out. The vacation ride made my big old brain feel drunker than Cooter Brown, whoever the hell that was. I looked around to see where I was. I was in a tool shed, fitting back in a corner behind a lawnmower. I scratched at it to see if it was real and got my hand all tangled up in some spider webs. Yep, it was real all right. I put my hand up my dress. 
There weren't no man parts down there. I was inside of one of them little girls. I didn't want to go up in there too far. Didn't much like messing around with little girls, I reckon. The door across the shed opened and I think I heard a bird chirping. Little old mouse scurried into another corner. Violet? Are you in here? The man hollered into the shed. It's just Deacon Brescius, Deacon Prine, and your pa. I peeked up over the side of the mower. The barn doors into the shed opened about halfway. I was back. I was back on Earth. I heard a voice in that June bug on my ear. Country, can you hear me? I looked out and saw them deacons enter the shed. Country, it's Hoop. Can you hear me? I pressed on the June bug like Mr. Hooper said. I hear you, I said. At least I think I said my voice sounded like a little girl. This is weird. Don't worry, the machine in your ear is cloaked when you're in the earth realm. You successfully crossed the plains. What do you see? The deacon started to enter the shed. Violet? It's your paw? We're here to help you. I pressed on that dream bug again and whispered like a cotton-tailed rabbit. I'm in the shed. Some men are coming in here. I think they want to help me? What should I do? Mr. Hooper laughed. <laughs> Flick the switch on the side of the receiver on your ear. I need to see what's happening. I need to handle the situation. Remember, no fuck-ups or I'm in the cabins for a long-ass time. I turned on a little switch on the side of that dune bug like Mr. Hooper told me. I felt a breeze come from outside through a hole in the shed. It smelled nice, like the magnolias were blooming on a spring day. It smelled better than that burnt pig shit in them caverns. It smelled like home. It made me remember home. I even think I heard a bird chirping outside. Good work. I can see the door and the men. Keep looking in that direction. I need to know what we're dealing with. Remember, no killing. I did as Mr. Hooper told me. Three shadows entered the shed. I grabbed onto the seat of the mower. Oh shit. What, Mr. Hooper, what do you see? I asked him. Open your eyes. Cold red country, they have bats and a shotgun. He was right. As soon as them deacons and that paw got to the middle of the shed, one of them clicked on a light bulb with a string. Two was all choking up on different bats, and the man who wasn't in a church outfit had a shotgun. I think that one was paw. Why do they have bats and guns, Mr. Hooper? I asked him, getting a little chilly from the hole in the shed. Jesus, country. They know that you're inside the little girl. Fucking Phillips blew our cover. We should abort. Abort? You should come back. They've already won. Looks like it's back to the caverns for me. Damn it. I ain't going back to no caverns, I yelled out. Violet? One of them men asked. We're here to help you. Come on out of that corner. Abort, country. Abort! I stood up and brushed off that spring dress that little girl had on. I tapped on the June bug. I ain't going back to them caverns. Violet, baby? It's Paul. What caverns, honey? One of them men said to me. I looked over next to me and grabbed a digging spade. You all better not come back here. I'll fucking kill you motherfuckers. I'll rip them dicks of yours and eat them like a possum pie. They all gasped as if they'd never heard a swear before. Country, God damn it! stand down. Fuck you, Mr. Hooper. I'm going to win this football game, I told him. You ain't got to worry about sucking no more dicks or eating no more vaginas. I jumped on top of that lawnmower seat and pulled that spade back behind my right ear. Little girl's hair fell in front of my face. Get out of here, you fucking Yankees. Go back to heaven. Daniel, go back in the house. You don't need to see this. The pa stood there crying like a woman. His shotgun fell onto the dirt floor. One of them deacons stepped to me. Violet, put down that shovel. The June bug started blaring static and buzzing in my ear, but I couldn't really hear nothing Mr. Hooper was saying to me. I turned off that switch that he had me turn on. I'm gonna kill you fuckers. 
I jumped at the deacon in front and shoved the spade right around his dick. He dropped to his knees and started begging me to stop. I shoved that thing in and out his gullet like I was churning butter. A lot of his insides dumped onto the ground in front of him. He fell on his knees like he was starting to pray. They weren't praying though. He was trying to pick up his gizzards and all and put it back inside of him. I started stomping through all them guts like I was jumping through sprinklers in the mud. I picked up a long string of him insides and wrapped it around his neck like I was putting Christmas lights on a tree. He coughed and screamed and it smelled kind of like he might have shit in his drawers. He started losing his breath and finally fell forward. I lifted up that spade and dug it clean through him from the other side. When he hit the ground flat and stopped flipping and flopping, I just dug my little girl hands into them ears of his and pulled his head off. That second deacon came at me with his bat and swung away, merrily missing my head. Stupid Yankee. I walked on top of that one who was dead and shoved my little girl fingers into his eyes. You don't fuck with my team! I ripped around in his sockets and scratched his face, tearing all the skin right off. Water pouring out of his eyes tickled on my fingers and made me smile. I wasn't in no cavern no more. Pa folded like a coward at a card table in the corner, squealing like a little baby hog. All he could say was, No, Violet, please stop. The second deacon came with me again. He didn't really have much of a face no more. Lord, give me power, he cried. I jumped off of the deacon whose head I ripped off on the floor of the shed. That one without a face was a humming songs about God and looking at me like he wanted to kill. I ran back over to the mower and I climbed up on the workbench. I snatched up two hammers that were sitting next to my dirty little girl feet. The deacon charged at me. Satan, leave this innocent child! He growled. I growled at him and he swung that bat of his and missed me again because I jumped like a bullfrog. It was about then that it became clear that I had some type of superhero powers. I threw myself at him and grabbed onto that neck of his, dragging him down to the dirt floor. Please, God, give me the power to fight the evils of... He didn't say another word on account of me smashing his mouth with the front of one of them hammers. I started laughing again as them teeth of his started jumping around like popcorn on a hot stove. I got up and danced around him doing the dosy do while he tried to grab that bat of his again. I took that other hammer and started using the claw side to hack away at his throat. He was choking and it sounded kind of like he was gurgling with bacon soda. I smacked that hammer into the bottom of that chin of his and then danced back round behind his head and ripped that jaw of his clean off his head. I heard Pa still crying. If he knew what was good for him, he'd just count the seconds of life that he had left and enjoy the show. I was done with the second deacon. I dug both of them hammers into both sides of his forehead. I wasn't counting, but I must have smashed into that skull of his ten times. I tried to shake his head, but he just dragged them claws further and further into his skull. He picked up his jaw and his teeth and junk, and then he tried his darndest to speak. I grabbed onto that tongue of his that was dangling like a dick on sex night, stepped on what was left of his throat, pulled it right out. I threw it over at Paul, letting him know that he was next. More static came through on the June bug. Country, goddammit, abort! Do not engage! Turn your camera back on! I ain't going back to them caverns, Mr. Hooper. That second Yankee deacon started to sputter out like a truck ran out of gas, so I stood up over him and started running piss out of my new girl parts all over that chest of his. Fuck you, deacon. There ain't no God to help you now. You go and tell that to Mr. Phillips. I never did like no cheaters. He weren't talking no more, so instead of going on about the devil and whatnot, I pulled them hammers out of his head. The second hammer was buried pretty deep, but I jimmied it loose. I looked Pa straight in the face as I smashed both claws down next between them eyes of his. With all my little girl's superhero power might, I cracked that head of his open like the Grand Canyon. 
His eyes busted out of them sockets and landed next to that pile of teeth and that jaw of his. The hammers flew out of my hands to both sides of that shed, and it dug my face into the bowl I made out of his head. I had tasted varmint brain before, but I never did try human brain until that day. Hadn't eaten nothing all those years in the caverns, and it weren't as good as I remember steak being, but it were delicious on that day. Country, what the fuck is going on up there? I can't lock your location. I need to bring you back now. You don't want to be trapped up there. I sniffed around like a coon hound to let Pa know that I was hunting. He was curled up in the corner with that shotgun his across his lap. Why are you crying, Pa? I asked him and wiped some of them brains off my face. All sorts of goo and muck dripped down the front of that dress of mine. The head of that first deacon was between us. I picked it up by the hair and rolled it like a bowling ball over to Pa. Please, Violet, he whimpered and tried to hide behind them hands of his. Please, Lord, please. Save my Violet. More static came through that June bug, but I couldn't hear no more Mr. Hooper. I stubbed my toe into one of them circular saw tables on my way to go play with Pa, and a blade fell near a little girl foot of mine. Pa put his hands together like he was praying. Please, God, please, God, please dispel this demon from my sweet violet. I bent over in that little girl dress and picked up that saw blade. One of them edges cut into my finger. I licked my little girl blood and spit it at Pa. He was still crying. It made me laugh. Country turned your camera back on. Before I knew it, I was standing over Pa. He stopped praying and looked up at me. Violet, it's Pa. Please come back to me. I raised up that saw blade and buried it into that spot between the little girl's devil finger and ring finger. Mr. Hooper was right. It felt worse than getting that hand of hers stuck in a wood chipper. I pressed it down as far as it would go, cracking and breaking bones in that top of that little girl hand. Then, when I finally buried it all the way down to my little wrist, I bent them little legs and started shitting on Pa's coveralls. Pa stopped crying and I grabbed his hand. Tell that Yankee Phillips that the South will rise again. I pulled Pa's arm out and right as he started shrieking, I used my new saw hand to chop off that arm of his. I kept shitting as I stood on top of him. He laid down, taking in his own dirty defeat. Then, I just beat his face in with his own arm. That wasn't killing him, so I took to the saw hand. I just started pulling him apart like a dog with a rag doll. Arms, then legs, then dick, then balls. He was choking on vomit and blood and whatever else, so I helped him out and shoved his fingers from the dead arm into his mouth. Still laughing and shitting, I kind of just started cutting holes in his face. After I got tired of that, I totally sawed his head right down the dead center. There was blood going everywhere in the shed like someone had shot a BB gun into the side of a swimming pool. I dug into his brain and ate away. My second non-verbin brain was better than the first one. Tasted every bit as good as a squirrel, I think. More static came through on that June bug. I've got you. You're coming back, country, you stupid fucking redneck. I opened my real eyes and the white trough started draining water like a bathtub. The cigarette case lid opened up just like it closed. Mr. Hooper ran over and smacked the side of the trough. What in the fuck did you do? I shook the vacation sweating out of my head and grabbed onto the side of that trough. <laughs> Maybe I'm a little bit more rock and roll than you was thinking. He threw them hands of his up and down like he was waving down a fire in the barn. What the fuck does that mean? I pulled my body up from the lawn chair and threw my leg over the side of the trough. Well, you said that I was a little bit country, and I said 
I was a little bit rock and roll. Is that a joke? Is that a fucking joke? He cursed. How do you even fucking remember that? I don't know, I told him. I was just playing the sport like you told me to. He stomped over to that light bright typewriter and punched a few of them keys. Jesus country, I told you not to kill anyone. What the fuck was that? Are you so fucking stupid that you took the sports reference literally? He tapped on that June bug in his ear. He waited a bit. He pushed some more buttons, then he looked back at me. You killed two of God's servants. An innocent man. The girl is dead for sure. You shoved a fucking saw blade straight through her hand, down to her wrist. It's too late to send to the cleanup crew. That tool shed is swarming with angels. They was trying to get me, I told him. They threw a big bunch of papers across the room at me. You know that this means I have to go back down to the caverns, right? Looks like it's a thousand years of me sucking the IT's dick and pussy again. Fuck. I didn't mean to get you in no trouble. His face went white like he just saw General Lee's ghost. He lifted that fat old finger of his and put it to his lips. He wanted me to shut up. I grabbed at the water bottle. It was full again. He tapped at the June bug on his ear. Hello, Phillips. I wasn't up there for very long, but I knew that breeze sure felt good. I tickled that June bug in my ear on the belly. The arms pumped in and out like a water pump at well. Maybe that June bug didn't have to stay on my ear after all. Mr. Hooper fell back in that seat of his and laid back on it like it was a rocking chair on a porch. His belly stuck out and popped one of them buttons on that shirt of his. He didn't even know. Yes, Phillips, I'm quite aware of what happened. He let out a big gasp and listened to his June bug. I drank some more water. Yes, Phillips, I get it. Well, it was your job to process him. I'm just supposed to handle him. I flipped on that switch on the side of my June bug and looked at Mr. Hooper and then at the glass TV on top of that desk of his. It was a TV camera, I reckoned. Of course, I know that I am the one who took the bet. He started yammering on again. I know he wasn't ready, you scumbag. You took advantage of me, Phillips. Phillips? Phillips? And then, I saw him tickle the belly on that June bug in his ear and flip the switch up and down three times. The bug's legs came off from round his ear and he threw it across the room. I was right. It did come off. I started walking over to where he threw it to get it from him. When I started bending over, he started screaming. You fucking idiot! Don't bother with that! I won't need that where I'm going. When I touched his June bug, it crawled away, so I didn't bother with it no more. Where are you going? Don't we have more games to play? Unfortunately for me, I'm going back to the cabins for Lord only knows how long. He started crying. Phillips is going to be our new handler. Mr. Hooper, I didn't mean no harm, I told him. I was just doing what felt right. He walked over to me and put his hand on my shoulder. I get it, country. You didn't know. It was my mistake. I should never have explained the job to you the way I did. More so, I should never have sent you on a mission without any training. Then, out of nowhere, a bunch of red sirens started flashing all around the room. They weren't there before, I don't think. What the hell now? Mr. Hooper yelled as he wiped all them tears off his fat face. He started running after the June bug, but it was too fast for him. Help me, country! I need to get this! I ran over by him and chased the June bug across the floor up and down the walls until we finally cornered it by the trough. Don't break it, country! I need it! I put my hands down and cupped them together. The June bug, with all his hundreds of legs, crawled right into my fingers like a cradle. I slowly got up and put out my hands. I suppose it was the least I could do for poor old Mr. Hooper. He plucked that little fella up on a few of its legs and put it over his ear. He tapped on the side. Phillips, what now? Code red, 559er? 
Not possible. He walked back to that light bright typewriter and pushed a few buttons. Some stuff happened on that window glass TV. Not gonna happen, Phillips. He turned a dial on the side of the desk. I understand that we're short-staffed. He... He just killed four people. There is no way I'm going to send him up again. He put those hands of his and pushed them downward. <laughs> I'll ask him. I took a drink of that water bottle. What's all these lights mean, Mr. Hooper? He tapped the new bug. We have a situation. A big situation. A code red 559 to be exact. I, I don't know what all that means, I confessed. It means that God and his team, I mean associates, are about to take down one of our most precious hosts. They are apparently angry about what happened earlier. You mean with me? Yes, country. With you. Well, I asked him, what can we do? Phillips wants to send you back into this host to fight off God's associates. I told him I'd ask you. I tickled that June bug on my ear. It was my chance. If Mr. Hooper was going back to the caverns, and so was I, I sure didn't have a whole lot of interest in sucking no IT's dick. I'll do it. I swear I won't kill nobody this time. He let out a giant gasp of air. Maybe we don't have to go back to the caverns. Get in the pod and prepare for transfer. He met the trough. I well, did as I was told. He tapped on his June bug. Phillips, we'll do it. You have to promise me, though, that if we do succeed in protecting the asset, that you will stand up for me. Mr. Hooper snapped his finger at the trough and then started tapping away at the light bright typewriter. Get in, he told me. Thank you, Phillips, he said. I know we haven't fixed the situation yet, but thank you. He tapped on his June bug and walked over next to me. They are going to let us do it, country. Sweet Jesus. Sweet Jesus, I said too. He bent down about the same time that lawn chair started dropping into that trough. The gravy started coming up around me again. What are the rules, country? Please listen to me this time. No killing no one. And? He tapped on my June bug. And don't take this off or turn her off. He put up his hand like he was saluting me. Thank you for serving the IT, soldier. I saluted him back. Figured it was the right thing to do. The cigarette case lid started to fold over me and the gravy filled up the trough. There was no way that I was going back to them caverns ever again. I opened my eyes. I was in bed. I reached in between my legs like I had before. There was no man parts there, but there sure was blood all over that little girl's legs. I looked at my fingers. They were little girl fingers. There was a song playing on a record player in the room. I recognized it. That song was called A Little Bit Country, A Little Bit Rock and Roll. I always liked that song. I think that was my favorite song. Dirty old fan was blowing cold air at me from a nightstand. I heard crickets chirping outside the window. I tapped on the June bug. Mr. Hooper, can you hear me? Yes, now turn on the camera. I got up out of that bed and looked out the window. I saw a nice farm outside and a rusty old swing set. I knew that swing set. Was it mine? I took a sip of a glass of water next to that fan. Two hound dogs ran by chasing a squirrel. All them years in the cavern made me forget how much I loved being alive. I wanted to be alive again. I don't think that I'm going to turn on that camera, Mr. Hooper. I whispered. What are you talking about, country? Turn on the camera. We have to protect the asset. We had a deal. I started rubbing on the June bug just like Mr. Hooper had before. No, we didn't have no deal. You had a deal with Mr. Phillips in that IT. God damn you, country. You can't do this to me. You signed a contract. 
That's where you're wrong. I never saw nothing and nothing has been processed. You said it yourself. I clicked the switch on the June bug up and down three times and it started coming loose from my ear. I want to be alive again, Mr. Hooper. I don't ever want to go back to them caverns. Don't do this, country. You can't do this to me. The June bug jumped off of my ear onto the floor and I didn't hear nothing in my ear no more. I were a free man. Free to be back on the earth. Listening to my favorite song and feeling the breeze from a hot summer night. I got out of the bed and started stomping away at the June bug with my bare foot to the beat of that song by Donnie and Marie that I remembered loving so much. It clicked and fizzed and sparked. Finally, it was all out of juice. I walked across my new room and picked up a little rag doll. I took it back to bed with me. It wasn't as good as feeling a woman next to me in bed, but it was better than hell. It was better than them caverns. And it was better than taking orders from fat old Mr. Hooper. Just before I started to fall asleep in my new life, my great new life, the door to the bedroom creaked open a little bit and light shined in from the hall. A man came into the room and made his way over to that new bed next to me. He sat down. It was me. Recognize yourself, Deacon Fuch? I started blinking and huffing. I tried talking back to Mr. Hooper's voice in my head, but no words were coming out of that little girl's mouth. How, how can you talk to me? I asked in my mind. Oh, come on, Johnny. Do you really think that hell is in the business of giving people promotions and sending them to Earth for vacations? Ha! I, I don't understand, sir. Please bring me back now. I kept yelling, but nothing was coming out. The man, me, started running his wet hands through that little girl's hair of mine with one of his bare hands, and then he started rubbing up inside my bloody girl parts. There is no back. There are no agents. There are no handlers. There is no Phillips. Our job is to punish people for their sins. It is hell, after all. <laughs> then, it all came back to me as quick as Mama Bird bringing food back to her nest. I was Deacon Johnny Fuch. I had my way with the little girls in my flock. I raped them. I beat them. I told them that I could rid their bodies of the devil's evil. The little girl I was in... I killed her. Her mom and pa told me that she had the devil in her on account of she was bleeding out of her body and carrying on. I buried her little body under that swing set outside of that window. I can't really say it was a pleasure getting to know you. And then... Just as my head went quiet again, the other me pushed my little girl head into that pillow on the bed. The little girl tried to scream. I tried to scream. Nobody heard nothing. The belt unbuckled for the first time in what would be a zillion more. Forever. I felt my own penis go inside that little girl as those wet, Bloody hands wrapped around that little girl's throat. Welcome to your eternity, Deacon Fuch. <laughs> The Other Side of the Grave by Matt Demersky Performed by Otis Chirey I'll be blunt. I went to India to kill myself. In a way, 
I got my wish. Life had become a bleak and gray thing that looked to be a prison woven out of countless invisible strands. Money, cubicle, bad food, bad sleep. I was two years out of college, and seeing the rest of my years flowing straight ahead with no deviation and no freedom. Raised on video games and television, I was now expected to suddenly fit into a drone-like routine, wake up far earlier than I'd ever had to before, sit at work going crazy from boredom for nine hours, then drive home to eat, sleep, and do it all over again. Was this really life? I held out for another year before I knew I couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't be a cog in a machine. But our world is not kind to young men who refuse the system. Every day on the way to work, I saw homeless people and how they were treated. I wouldn't go out like that. No, that was just a slow suicide all its own. I'd always been fascinated by television shows about other countries. So I chose my favorite and I spent the remainder of my bank account on a ticket to India. Once I was there, once I had seen all the wonderful sights and experienced another culture, well, there was nothing after that. No plans. Once you're out of money, you're as good as dead anyway. Turned out India wasn't much different than home. Coffee shops, crowded streets, jobs... The same bitter meal, just a slightly different scent and flavor. It shouldn't have been like that. It was supposed to be different. Another continent, same prison. I begged for change until I got enough to buy a bottle of sleeping pills. They weren't even that expensive, but the experience of asking strangers for money for two days straight was enough to convince me I was doing the right thing. I found a corner and ate them all a handful at a time. I don't even remember falling asleep. It was as if I'd been thrust a thousand feet deep under the ocean, and I was rising. For a time, I thought I was free from my body and soaring up to heaven, but instead I burst up out of the waters of Leith and banged my head into wood. A bunk bed? No. My arms were sore and tingly from disuse, but they still listened. My half-numb fingers found a rough surface about two inches above my face. It was dark. Why was it dark? And why was it hard to breathe? I began trying to flex my legs, but they didn't want to move. I managed to curl my toes after some effort, then the pain in my thighs and ankles seared into my awareness. My legs were bent and must have had poor blood flow for quite some time. I clenched my fists against the pain and just remained like that until the pain finally passed. After that, I tried to stretch, and the truth hit me. I was curled up in a small wooden box. But why and where? I pressed against the sides of the box, but felt absolutely no give. It was poor quality wood with very little strength, which meant something had to be blocking it on the other side, and that meant... Oh, God! The bottle of sleeping pills must have nearly killed me, but not completely. They must have thought I was dead. They buried me alive! I was lucky to even have this box, really. As a foreigner, as someone with no money, had someone put me inside it as an act of kindness? If they'd just thrown me in a pit and buried me, I'd have been dead already. That logic didn't help keep the panic back for more than a few seconds. I began screaming and beating at the thin wood with all my strength. Bits of dirt sifted down from above, but I kept attacking the wood until it began pouring down like the grains in an hourglass. The air was stale and I was suffocating, but I had no better plan. I would either die now or find... Yes, 
They hadn't buried me deep at all, maybe a few inches. Sunlight. I could see sunlight. And air. Air flowed in. Oh, God. The sweetest breath, despite the choking dirt in the air. I screamed for help. There was no reply. Was I in some sort of graveyard? Of course. I had to be. My shout had to be, in reality, a small whimper. Nobody would ever hear it. I waited. I didn't hear anyone. Every so often, I shouted as loud as I could. The light outside dimmed, went dark, and then reappeared over the course of a cold night. That morning, it began to rain. A little bit of water trickled down, and I drank as much as I possibly could. The box creaked as the dirt above grew heavier, and I was forced to roll onto my back and prop up my weak roof with my knees. I wasn't strong enough to bash my way up, but it could certainly fall in on me and crush me. How do I convey what it's like to be buried alive? Every story I've read or every movie I've seen focuses on the initial terror of waking up underneath the earth, forgotten. That passed quickly. The era after that was an endless one of waiting, thinking, and guessing. Do I shout now? Do I wait? Do I conserve my strength and try to break up through the surface when the dirt dries out? I hope it doesn't rain so hard that the earth will dry, but... But I hope it does rain so I won't die of thirst. But I also hope it doesn't rain too hard or I'll drown. As always, 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 the box is present, like part of your body. No matter what position you choose, you can feel every single side of it. It's right there with you, like a shell, like a second skin. You come to know every knot and grain in the dark, you even repair it and prop it up with your own strength, even though it is a damn thing that you are trapped inside. The box is death, but the box is also life. For two days it didn't rain. Then, right about noon, judging by the initial brightness of my soul beam of light, a new darkness joined me in my box. I thought someone had walked over my grave and I began shouting, but no, it was a thunderstorm. I prayed. You bet I prayed. I've never been a religious guy before, but please, please, I said, please keep that rain to a light drizzle. When an inch of water had built up around me in my box, I knew it was time to act. It was do or die. I practice a pose worthy of Cirque du Soleil, and I got into it now. Bare feet planted solidly in that inch of water, knees out, arms curled under, back against the ceiling, all inside a box about two feet high. I pushed. The wood cut into my back, but I pressed with all the strength left in my legs. There was a small give above, as if I was making a little bump in the dirt where some person might see it. I strained so hard, put so much of myself into that attempt, that I felt nothing else. I envisioned myself bursting free into the open air and rain. That's all I had to do. My body gave out first, and I rolled onto my back to rest for a second try. Something up there had moved. I knew I could do it, given time. But the box betrayed me and caved in on top of me. Dirt poured in as I fruitlessly fought the flow. I put my mouth to the narrow air hole in an attempt to avoid suffocation. All that did was leave me completely trapped and totally unable to move while wet dirt squeezed in over my eyes and around my neck. I was entirely encased in dirt except for my mouth, which was open to the air, and the rain was intensifying. I drank as much rainwater as I could. I even began eating the traces of mud it brought down with it. Anything I could to keep that narrow hole in the ground above clear. Eventually, though, the rain overtook me, and I was forced to close my mouth and hold my breath. 
That was it, then. There were no more plays, no more tries. I'd come to India to die, even tried to kill myself with pills. And yet here I was, fighting desperately, down to the very last second, just to cling to life one moment longer. I was immobile underground with a funnel of rainwater growing heavier on my closed mouth. How long could Olympic divers hold their breath? I'd seen a show once while flipping through the channels. Was it three minutes? Was it four? God, the pressure on my chest. I haven't even gotten a full breath. Sixty. Sixty-one. Sixty-two. Sixty-three. I knew I was nearing my limit. What did I want to spend the last minute or two of my life thinking about? Girls I've dated? My favorite movies? It was all nothing, but it was everything. Every mundane little thing in the entire world was now a luxury I would never have again. I would stroke the fabric of my cubicle at my boring job, if only to see again, to breathe one more time. Thunder struck overhead so loud that I could hear it even in my prison of mud. I wish I could say that at the last moment the hillside gave way under the fury of that monsoon and spilled me out onto a mudslide of corpses. Uh, that's what local law enforcement and doctors insisted on when I tried to tell them the truth. To them, I was just a crazy foreigner that had been traumatized by being buried alive. And they refused to listen. Because I was not saved at the last second by the weather, in fact, I wasn't saved at all, I counted to a hundred and forty before my awareness started to halo out into shimmering white. Keep my mouth closed. Keep my mouth closed. Keep my mouth closed. Water, dirt, mud, pressure. Keep my mouth closed. That was all that remained. If you open your mouth, you die. But if you don't uh, breathe, you also die. No choices. Something was tugging at me just before I gave in. Something was pulling at me, not from above, but from below. Chill iciness wrapped around my limbs and began to pull me down. I remember the spray of released rainwater as it shot down from the hole where it had built up. Then I was dragged through the earth at a breakneck pace. Keep my mouth shut. Keep my mouth shut. No longer. I let out dead air and gasped. Somehow, I was alive. I'd been deposited somewhere full of soft, round lumps and hard, straight lines. The air here was breathable but horribly foul. For as much as I'd wanted to escape darkness, I let myself just be alive for a few minutes. I think I knew something was wrong, but it wouldn't begin until I opened my eyes. Finally, I was fully conscious again. Still dark. N no light. I began to crawl along the acrid piles. Long, solid objects clocked hollowly against another. Big, round, soft lumps rolled as I pushed my way across. As I went, I began to suspect, but I didn't truly know, until my hand fell upon the unmistakable lay of a cold nose and mouth. The human head rolled away down the pile of bones I was crawling over. I saw nothing, but I knew. Had the graveyard somehow rotted underneath? Had rainwater deposited all the bodies down in some sort of cave? I was alive, at least for the moment, but this was somehow worse than the box. At least in the box I could shout and pray someone would hear me. If I was in a corpse-filled sinkhole, well... There was nothing to do but starve, a fate which would take years if new bodies were continually sliding down into my muddy prison every time it rained. God, what if I never died? What if enough water and human meat made it down here to keep me alive for decades? Could I really eat a corpse? Funny. I hadn't actually cried while in that box. In that box, everything was simple. Here, loneliness and starvation would turn me into a monster. 
I crawled around that sinkhole for hours, testing each side of the massive pit. The sides were solid dirt, packed hard by ancient geological processes. There was a small span of time where I considered building some sort of scaffolding out of bones. There were certainly enough, and tons of clothes and hair, to tie them off with. It was a grim thought, but seemingly the only way out, until the door opened. There was no light. I only heard it. In that sinkhole, there were only two sounds. The water draining away in a narrow crack between two hard plates of rock, and me. After at least two days down there, I knew the moment the door opened. It was nothing but a soft sigh of smooth metal and warm air, but I began moving toward it immediately. There was also a fourth sound. Something moved along the pile of bones, sending bones scattering and heads rolling. It was swift and mostly silent, and it dragged something back out. I chased after it and dove into the gap that hadn't been there before. I got inside before it closed. Metal. Warm metal. It was still pitch black, but I could feel smooth, warm metal under my hands. Maintenance shaft, I guess, but for what? Had some animal found a grate in the sewers and given me my escape? I felt behind me, but the door was solid metal, not a grate, and covered with unfamiliar, sleek patterns. Checking, I found that I could push it open if I wanted to. It opened only from the inside, and I had somehow missed it while feeling the sides of the sinkhole. I could go back if I wanted to, but to hell with that. I turned and started crawling ahead. There was really no way to tell how long the warm and smooth metal tunnel was. I'd been in darkness so long that I'd lost all sense of distance and time. I crawled until my hands and feet were too weak to move, then I stumped along on my elbows and knees. This was going somewhere. This had to be going somewhere. I slept, encased in warmth. When I put my head to a soft, round hump of metal, I could hear a hissing and falling humming, as if everything around me were alive, asleep, and breathing softly somewhere deep and distant. How long had I been underground by then? A week? For the first time in a week, I found light. When I awoke and kept crawling again on sore hands, I finally emerged into an open chamber that held its own dim gray ambient glow. As happy as I was to finally see again, and even then only the barest on darkness that any normal human eye would have seen as pitch black had they not spent a week underground craving light, I also knew I was not nearly home nor safe. Here the sleek metal tubes of the tunnel expanded to form a sort of rectangular mortuary. There was no floor, only a maze of pipes overlapping one another. The pipes bulged upward in places in a series of table-like formations— on these knotted beers rested six corpses in various stages of decay. Two of the tables were empty. Yeah, from bad to worse. But my time, buried alive, had beaten all the fear out of me. Death was no longer the worst possible outcome. I had to keep going. The chamber had multiple ways out, and none of them looked official. I crawled up a pipe-lined hole and hid there as I heard something sighing outside a larger gap. As I squeezed myself tighter and tighter into shadow, I watched an enormous organic metallic hand on a thousand juxtaposed joints slide in without a sound and pick up the farthest corpse in the row. From the sound, I knew that this was what had entered my sinkhole. This was what had stolen a corpse. This had reached all the way down that interminable tunnel on its endless metal-jointed arm, and now it was taking one of the bodies to another chamber. Creeping by sourceless gray, barely light, I moved down the subtly pulsing tunnel beyond, following the arm as it receded into gloom. It was dangerous and my heart threatened to pound through my ribcage, but I had nowhere else to go. 
I only barely caught my breath as I came face to face with a human skull. I nearly screamed. Set in the wall, no, part of the wall, it gaped with open eyes at nothing. Tubes of a dozen different varieties, all smooth chrome, had entered it through the ears and mouth and spinal cord area. The ends of those connections gleamed as spikes and fluid carriers. Were they once connected to something? Moving on, I followed the curve of the wide, metallic cave until I reached what looked like twin operating rooms. A steel bush of micro-arms hovered over a pipe bulge beer within each room, picking and clawing at a corpse on each table. No, not picking at. I crept closer, wary of that greater arm that had deposited the left body and then departed somewhere. The body on the left table was long decayed, but tiny claws and surgical instruments on arms between six and ten feet long appeared to be dipping into a wide bath in the floor filled with random pieces of human flesh, and then carefully applying those pieces to the skull of the dead patient. I slipped and tumbled into the room, nearly sliding into the vat of flesh, but gripped warm metal at the last second. Had I been caught? No. The surgical arms never even so much as slowed. They didn't care at all about me. I hugged the wall, knowing the same might not be true of that bigger arm. As I watched, the arms reconstructed the face of a human being. They did not rebuild his hair or skin, only the muscles around the skull, and then two eyes were plucked from the vat and inserted with great care. For the first time since I'd been buried alive, I felt vaguely not alone, although the eyes just stared straight up. They had no eyelids and as yet no muscles to move them. What were these machines doing? The arms began filling the inner portions of the skull where I could not see. Then they flitted quickly down the table, piecing together a spine and the core of a nervous system. Between the ribs, the next thing they fused together were two different lung sacs from a vat. A small arc of electricity shocked the heart placed in between. The head, lungs, heart, and ribcage on the table began screaming. Loud echoes of terror and shock radiated out from our organic metal surgery room. I froze in absolute terror for an eternal moment, and then jumped forward. I hissed, Shut up! It'll hear you! The muscle-bound skull could not move, but the eyes sitting within did. Ever so slowly, those irises focused on me. Its windpipe moved visibly between its skull and septum. Its lungs contracted with effort. It said something in Hindi. I put my fingers to my lips. Shh! The reanimated half-body said one more sentence in Hindi then closed its jutting jaw to signal it would remain silent. Was it a man or a woman? What had it said? It watched me sidelong with terrified eyes as I climbed into the other operating room. The same thing was happening there, but the process was not as far along. The machines here were pulling from a vat filled with bone fragments and rebuilding a spinal column below a cracked skull. I must have rocked back and forth for a solid minute as the insanity of what I was seeing overwhelmed me. What the hell was this? I must have gone insane. I was still in that sinkhole. No. Whenever I turned and looked over my shoulder, I could see those horrified, muscle-ringed eyes watching me, hoping I would do something. The surgical arms continued their work, adding more nerves and pieces of the circulatory system. The arms had seen fit to ignore me so far, but it was too dangerous to interfere with their work. To that man or woman on the table, I whispered, I'll come back for you. I waited for a nod, listened to a third sentence in Hindi, then headed on. I repeated the foreign syllables in my mind, hoping to memorize them and translate them later if I ever saw civilization again. 
Who knew what terrible secrets that the animated man or woman had seen? The curve continued, taking me through a cathedral-like area, where pools of black water stank under a ribcage of thick metal bones, dripping ichor from ancient tubing. The light here was still barely perceptible, and so thin that I had to move my head back and forth to make out shapes, but it was definitely shifting from gray to blue as I climbed across the vast valley. At no place and no junction were there ever signs, texts, or floors to stand on. Nothing about this place was for humans. I wasn't even sure I was on the bottom, per se, as there was no difference between the floor and the ceiling, or indeed even the walls. The whole place could have been upside down or at an angle for all I knew. Or there was no intended orientation at all, and it had just all grown haphazardly. Because grown had to be the right word. The metal conduits were warm and alive, and I couldn't feel a single seam or welding mark. Perhaps a cave system had already existed here, and a horrible seed of some sort had grown to fill it over centuries. Or perhaps I was inside an enormous demon skull, even now, as it slept inside the earth, and this was simply its body. The world was a farce, and this defied everything I'd ever known. Legs. The next vast chamber held hundreds of pairs of human legs jutting from the walls. Not for me. That chamber was not for me. Too much the mind can face some things. I climbed upward, ever upward, deeper into the blue light. At the apex, the most excruciating dark blue light somehow, sharp and dull at the same time, I found an oval room, hosting a dozen odd dark devices, and a face set in the wall at the end. It was the face of a woman, and her eyes were closed. Tubes and conduits connected her to bulging head, as I'd seen in that skull before, and my mind began to grasp something about the nature of the place. Aging, growth, change. I couldn't explain it in words, but the dark spirit behind those closed eyes... I knew that if she happened to wake and look my way, I would suffer a fate ten thousand times worse than death. The next tube surrounded ramp upward lay beyond her. Moving as slowly and as quietly as I could, I stepped from one round pipe to the next, my gaze jumping from my bare feet to her closed eyes twice a second. When I saw her twitch, I moved. Her lids opened slowly, and I saw her eyes move gently, back and forth, sweeping the room. She did not see me. I was clinging to the wall below, staring directly up at her chin. Her mouth did not open, but I thought I heard a hum of suspicion. It counted two hours after her lids had closed again before I crept along the base of the wall and up the ramp. Blue shifted to violet as I ascended. I kept going up and up and up, climbing pipes, avoiding dripping black rivulets, and always staying quiet. There was a sleeping awareness about this whole place, a towering, monstrous machination waiting for ages, running pieces of itself on automatic in the meantime, but ever wary of intruders. And I found it there in the violet basilica, when the light became so painfully violet that I knew human eyes had ever seen this place, I found a sleeping giant. It was mostly fetus, mostly brain. It was maybe ten or fifteen times as tall as me, and it was floating suspended in dark ichor inside a glass tube that ran from a biomechanical base right to the ceiling unfathomably high above. As I stared in utmost horror and tried to comprehend it, as I watched its brain stomach expand and contract slowly as it breathed from thick tubes, I saw that it was just one of a dozen. Like massive pillars in double colonnades, I stood at the center of a gigantic cathedral built to worship and house horrific sleeping beings. 
I stood in the center, in a circle of pipes, and for the first time I recognized the use of that space. If they had been awake, those twelve would have floated in their foul chambers and gazed down upon me in judgment. There was a court of some inhuman, exotic law, and we all had been judged guilty. I ran. I no longer cared about being quiet. My bare feet hammered along those uneven round conduits until I was through that basilica and beyond into darkness, where I was sure light still glimmered, but past violent, beyond what human eyes could see. I just kept climbing hour after hour, sometimes up, sometimes down. And then I climbed up through a narrow tube, barely big enough for me to squeeze through, and found myself back in the left operating chamber. Somehow I'd gotten so turned around that I had come full circle. That, and I was on the ceiling. Ports and biomechanical adaptations had been fitted to the ribcage on the operating table above, and skin had been grafted on and was being fused together by medical lasers. I could now see that it was a woman, and she was staring up at me both in confusion that I was on the ceiling, and in hope that I had returned. I'd been right about the lack of an orientation in this horrible place. Could it? Yes. I climbed up the wall and felt my sense of direction adapt as I went. The entire time, I could have been on the walls or ceilings without knowing it. I simply never tried to circle the chamber's sides, rather than climb along the bottom as I understood it. The question it left me was simply, where the hell was I? and there was no escape, except back to the sinkhole from hence I'd come. I sat for a time with that Hindi woman, but we didn't know each other's language, so all we could do was wait and pray. The larger claw soared by at regular intervals. I watched its arm twist and move as it worked farther down the line. I guessed that there were other operating rooms and likely other graveyards being pilfered from below. This was death. This was the afterlife for all intents and purposes. We put our dead in the ground in this place, took them and rebuilt them for its own ends. There was nothing I could do. Although the table in the right chamber was rebuilding an entire skeleton, the Hindi woman near me only had her top half remade, half biomechanical, half organic, she struggled as the large arm came to claim her. She screamed, but one of the surgical arms clasped and screwed a metal mask over her mouth, silencing her. I stood, unmoving, and clutching the walls until the large arm deposited another pile of bones and left the surgical table to its work. The arm didn't care about me. Nothing here did. A week must have passed while I wandered those ghastly halls. There was nothing to learn, nothing to see, nothing to figure out. No tools, no exits. I was beginning to starve, but I refused to do it. I refused. Even though there were whole vats of flesh just waiting to be eaten, I couldn't. I wouldn't. The black ichor was water. Stained water, darkened with something undefinable, but it kept me alive. Unable to bear the afterlife any longer, I eventually found a new oval room and gave myself up. Among the black devices was a woman's face, just like the other blue-lit control room, and I waited for her to open her eyes. When she did, I recognized them. I knew those eyes. She spoke. Her mouth was masked and unmoving, but her voice came from the walls somehow. The words began Hindi, but transformed into something unintelligible as the connections around her head bulged forcefully. The claw was upon me in moments. Chill, solid fingers wrapped around me, and I recognized the feeling. This claw had taken me down from my box and deposited me in the sinkhole. I was captured, and I expected to... What? Be torn apart? Killed? Become a cog integrated into the machine exactly as I had always feared, even before I had been buried alive? The claw 
carried at me an unnerving speed through blue, gray, and even yellow-lit biomechanical tunnels until darkness shrouded me and a rising sensation gripped my stomach. Finally, we hit something hard, and I was thrown free in a slurry of mud and water in the grip of a tremendous storm. She'd let me go. Somehow, that woman had used some shred of her human willpower to eject me from the afterlife. I couldn't save her, but she'd saved me, at least for the moment. I was free. The odyssey that had begun with my suicide attempt was over, and I was back in the world of the living. I survived the storm and even tried to tell the authorities about what was waiting under the earth and stealing their dead, but they just laughed me off. It was also then that I learned a bit about Hindi customs and that most Hindus are cremated. Did they suspect? Did their ancestors somehow know what was under the world stealing the buried? The graveyard I'd been buried alive in was for a mix of various peoples and tribes, those who couldn't afford cremation and unclaimed foreigners. It was possible the storm had wiped away the entire thing, like I'd been told, but I suspected that the nightmare beneath had closed its sinkhole because my escape had compromised that particular location. While trying to understand what I'd experienced, I translated the Hindi woman's four sentences in their meaning. To me, is worse than anything I witnessed. She'd said first, when she'd been just a muscle-bound skull and lungs, Thank you. Thank you. After I begged her to remain quiet, she said, I'm just happy to be able to move again. And when I told her I'd come back for her, she said, Don't interfere. I want this. And when I'd finally seen her as part of that nightmare, as a face set in the wall and gagged for eternity, speaking only through biomedical means, she'd said, When we die, we stay where we lie. Our bones, our dust, remain aware for all time. This place is trying to help us. They are trying to help us, though they do not understand us. We know them. They're angels. But her words became some unknown language after that. I wrote down their phonetic syllables, but they're meaningless as far as anyone, even experts, can tell. And I am left with the horror of knowledge, the haunting paralysis born of what I have seen and heard, from the mouth of someone who died and been rebuilt, when we die, we stay where we lie. Our bones, our dust, remain aware for all time. Suicide is now the last thing on my mind. We survive, we must survive for as long as we can, no matter the cost, each and every single one of us, for death is not the end. No, death is just the start, the beginning of a lonely agony that will never, ever end no matter how badly you want it. I thought being trapped in a box for a few days was bad, but now I know that death is worse. Now I travel from graveyard to graveyard, looking, hoping, begging to find that underground nightmare once more. I beg to be a part of that machine, a part of hell. I would make a deal with the devil, or worse, with those sleeping beings in the violet basilica, Take my flesh, if only so that I may live and breathe in some form. For death is without hope and without peace. Death has no escape, no air holes, no cramped limbs, no shouting for rescue. Death is being buried alive with nothing but your thoughts forever. Till the Road Runs Out by Luciano Marino The ratty double-wide burned faster than they expected, and when the whiskey-fueled flames reached the meth lab in the trailer's back bedroom, the explosion was likewise extraordinary. Hicks gulped the last of the Jack Daniels and wiped his mouth with his hand. The flames were warm against his shirtless torso. 
his muscles hard and lean from his most recent turn inside. He leaned back in the Mustang's hood, feeling toasty, inside and out, as he was tickled by the heat of the fire and the fuzzy embrace of booze. He ran a hand over his fresh buzz cut, crossed one booted ankle over the other, and casually lobbed the empty bottle into the fire. He cast an admiring glance at Dakota. He looked hot, like something out of a vintage heavy metal video, standing near the trunk in tight jeans and black boots and a tank top. Platinum highlights streaked through his long, raven-hued hair. Dakota hugged himself and watched his childhood home burn, a cocky smirk on his glossy lips. Hicks felt something at his feet and looked down to see a fat orange cat running against him. He kicked it, though not hard. It hissed. He chuckled. Dakota stepped over and slapped his shoulder and picked the cat up. Asshole, Dakota said, nuzzling it lovingly. Be nice to my pussy. Hicks shoved off from the car and pulled Dakota close. The warm cat pressed between them. He grabbed a handful of that luscious, dark hair and pulled, just hard enough, just the way that Dakota liked, and he said, Fuck your pussy. Dakota's tongue snaked out and licked Hicks's stubbly chin. Promises, promises. First things first, Hicks said. They kissed, the fire roaring before them. First, we see the Duke. He saw this shit. He looked at Dakota, looked him up and down real slow, like he enjoyed every inch of the view. Then, we'll take care of the rest. Hicks opened the passenger door and Dakota slid in, petting the cat gently. Hicks slammed it shut and walked around, grabbing his jacket from the top of a pile of bags in the back seat through the open window. It wasn't much to look at now, but it was everything worth taking from this place. Plus, a shitload of crystal. Whatever else he'd been before he became barbecue, Dakota's father had been a hell of a cook. He'd offered up his whole stash before Hicks had introduced his face to a shotgun. A right nice gesture, really. Of course, they were taking the stuff anyway. And his money. And his guns. His blubbery apologies were years too late for Dakota, and Hicks had done worse things for less worthy causes. Killing that son of a bitch had been just the cherry on the Sayonara Sunday on their way out of this pit. That was so hot, babe, Dakota said. The way you made him cry. Hicks put on his coat and slipped into the driver's seat, gunned the engine and spared one more look at the conflagration. Didn't I tell you I'd take care of it? Dakota hugged the cat. Do you love me? All the way, baby, Hicks said. Till the road runs out. He threw the hot rod in gear, peeled out and made for the highway, bearing down hard, chasing, and finally gaining on. His own little bloody slice of the American dream... The Mustang devoured the road. The engine roared like a hungry beast as they sped west into the humid North Florida night. Hicks turned his head and Dakota slipped a Marlboro between his lips, holding out the flaming Zippo. He sucked deep, pressed down on the gas. Ozzy wailed from the radio. Waffles slept on the bags. What kind of a name is Waffles for a cat? Hicks said. Dakota only shook his head patronizingly, as if the question were far too stupid to bother with, and he lit a cigarette for himself. Hicks said, It's a good thing you're pretty. Dakota rolled his sparkly eyes and smiled. He could be on his way to the grocery store instead of fleeing a murder scene. Hicks liked that. He'd been concerned that Dakota was all talk in the joint, and he'd watched real close for signs of doubt back at the trailer. When Dakota kicked things off, breaking a lamp over dear old daddy's head, Hicks had known he was for real, and he had been glad. 
He'd had every intention of making off with the goods either way, really. Alone, if need be. But that's not how he wanted it. Definitely not anymore. Hicks wasn't nervous either. He felt no guilt. The speeding was more for the joy of the ride, and his love of his car and the rush of newly reclaimed freedom than fear of getting caught. The cops didn't come out here unless they had to. No neighbors in the trailer park would have called them. They all had secrets of their own to hide. The fire department would come, but even after they found the body, it would look like another meth lab accident. By the time the so-called authorities figured out how Brad Chambers actually bought it, well, they'd be long gone. Hicks was calm, though he wouldn't be totally at ease until after meeting with the Duke. He didn't like drugs, and he hated drug dealers. Hated their fake-ass, tough-guy posturing and drama. Still, there was nobody better to help them unload a stash this size. The money wouldn't be exactly fair, but it'd be pretty close. And for now, pretty close was close enough. He pulled a pistol from between the seats and switched it to his left hand. What are you doing? Dakota said. Hicks aimed at the highway marker and pulled the trigger without slowing down. A hole exploded in the green metal sign overhead. A crater replaced the dot above the I. So off, <laughs> Dakota said. His flirty giggle made Hicks think about porch swings and campfires, sunny beaches and snow on Christmas, cold beer in the morning and hot sex at night. And these were a few of his favorite things. Hicks replaced the gun. Dakota leaned over and laid on his chest, one hand moving under his jacket, lazily stroking the smiling devil tattoo on Hicks's stomach. The kid was asleep in seconds. He wasn't really a kid, of course, but he just seemed so young to Hicks that sometimes there wasn't anything else to call him. Hicks snuck a peek down feeling Dakota's warm, rhythmic breathing on his chest, and watched his lover's closed eyes twitch. He'd been sneaking glances at the kid for days, thinking about not thinking about him, after Dakota first arrived inside, long before they actually met. It had been Dakota's first time in real jail, and it showed. Hicks had seen the kid take a few beatings, but he hadn't stepped in. He'd been a career con doing his own time, and he'd only wanted to be left alone. Helping people got you killed, he knew that for certain. Though, Hicks had still not been able to help himself from thinking about the new arrival with the pretty eyes. Theirs was not a meet-cute by any Hollywood standard, not even by porno standards. But we don't get to choose who we love in this world, Hicks thought. No more so than we get to choose how we meet them. He had come across two big Aryans going at the kid, and he hadn't thought twice. Having caught them with their pants actually down, he had all the advantage he needed and more. By the time the guards responded, Hicks had painted the cell in a fresh coat of red blood. To the hole he'd gone, but it was a small price to pay. When he came back to the block, Dakota was waiting for him. I started talking. When Hicks got out, there were letters. Letters became phone calls. Phone calls became visits. By the time Hicks got out, they'd had a plan. He made a few calls, picked up his car, and come calling on Dakota. Happiness isn't just for pretty people, Hicks thought. It's not just for rich people, smart people, or even just for nice people. After a lifetime of tough breaks and raw deals, bad choices and worse luck, he figured it was only fair that even a broken-down con inching ever further past forty had the right to a shot at some happiness in this fucked-up world. Everyone should get a chance. And this was his. He knew he wouldn't get another. But that was okay. One was all he needed. He'd always been a good shot. A solitary figure was stumbling down the dirt road. Hicks could smell his happy ending begin to rot. There shouldn't be anybody out here, he thought. 
That's the point of the spot. The Duke didn't hold court in nowhere, Alabama, for the scenery. It was a lonely place, a million miles from anywhere a sane person would want to be. He flicked on the high beams, recognized the wounded man, and realized that, as bad as he thought it might be, it was actually much worse. He threw the car into park. Stay here, Hicks said to Dakota as he grabbed the pistol and got out. Before him, the man fell to his knees in a widening pool of blood, squinting dazedly into the car's lights. Georgie, Hicks said, kneeling to look the man over closely. It's Hicks. What happened? Where's your brother? Where's Duke? Slowly, Georgie turned to look at Hicks, and his bruised lips spread into a lazy smile. I got good, he said, <laughs> voice cracking with a sudden, tittering giggle. I got good, Hicks. So much guts. <laughs> and he really did. They were in his hands. Cupped near his waist, Georgie carried two handfuls of dripping intestines. A few loose ends dangled absently, having slipped through his fingers. Blood and bile oozed out of the ragged gash in his stomach beneath a silk shirt that had once been white. Dakota's door opened, but Hicks waved him back. He grabbed Georgie's shoulder and shook him. Where's Duke? Who did this? <sighs> Santa Morte, Georgie whispered. As cold as it was, Hicks' heart was gripped by icy fingers of fear at the words. Saint death. A folktale god, deity of the damned. The skeletal Madonna had become the patron saint of murderers, drug dealers, and even more deranged members of the underworld. Hicks had seen tattoos and prayer cards in the joint. Most of it was harmless. A sort of grassroots religion among the new outlaw class. But, like all religions... It had fanatics, and they were true maniacs. This was as ugly as it could be. Legit deathheads were bad news, a cult of criminals who worshipped the Grim Reaper. If Duke and his boys had run afoul of lunatics like that, there would be nothing left of them to save. Not that Hicks was interested in coming to their rescue. What he wanted was much more practical than salvation. Georgie. Hicks said. Did Duke bring the money? No answer. The gutted man swayed on his knees, stared into the headlights. Hicks tried again. Did Duke bring the money? Is it still at the spot? Georgie retched, the bloody vomit spilling over the mound of exposed guts he cradled in his arms. Hicks grabbed the man's slim ponytail, jerked his head back and pressed the pistol to Georgie's crotch. He spoke very slowly. Is my money still at the spot? Answer me, Georgie, or I swear I'll bury your balls with whatever's left of your brother. Georgie nodded. He brings it. Now. Tell me where. You're not serious, Dakota said. We can't. We can't, Hicks agreed, pushing the Mustang off the dirt road. I can. Bullshit. We can't make a new life with fifty grand worth of ice. We need money. I'm going to. Dakota reached into the back seat and grabbed the shotgun. No. Hicks said. I'm just going to have a look. Then there's no reason I can't go. Georgie moaned from the passenger seat. Oh. Hicks said, Don't you bleed in my car, you stupid spick. Oh. Dakota held the gun by the slide and cocked it with one hand. He reached for the blue duffel bag that held the others and slung it over his shoulder, then smiled and blew Hicks a kiss. Sissy. Bitch. Hicks said. The night wind swept through the sparse trees and silence held sway over the world. 
One shot, Hicks thought. Make it count. Fine. Let's do this. Waffles me out in the back seat as he watched them leave, and Hicks couldn't help but wonder. Was the fat bastard shouting encouragement? Or a warning at their backs? The bonfire in the center of the circled vehicles burned bright, fueled by the bodies of slain cartel members and the wood and shrubbery gathered beneath them. Duke and his entire gang were crucified, hoisted up on makeshift timber crosses, blazing away before the writhing orgy of carnage below them. A pyromaniac's version of Jesus. Hicks smelled the charred flesh before he saw it. He expected the worst, and he was not disappointed. At his side he heard Dakota gag. On the ground, the death's heads painted each other with the innards of another body. They were naked, emaciated, and awful to look upon. Their skeletal fingers tore slippery pieces from the gaping wound at the dead man's belly, smearing themselves with gore. The body had no head. Hicks saw three of the psychos off to the left, kicking something around like a soccer ball. Something with long, dark hair. A putrid corpse dressed in white robes sat before the fire and the burning bodies in a ratty armchair. Dead flowers, along with severed body parts, were scattered around it. Burning red candles encircled the cult's dreadful idol as it watched over the ritual. Hicks and Dakota sank to the ground outside the light of the fire. Hicks counted at least eight of the cultists, maybe more in the clearing. Even if there had been nine or ten enemies, he might not have hesitated to take them on alone, armed as he was. He'd beaten worse odds. But death heads were something else. Hicks eyed a black Durango with tinted windows on the far side of the fire. There it is. That's where Georgie said it'd be. Dakota shook his head. No way. I'm getting what we came here for. We don't need it. We've got cash already. Not enough. A wail rose up from the gathering by the fire as the death heads finally clawed the eviscerated corpse apart. Fuck it. Dakota said. We'll figure something out. Let's just dump the drugs and bail. But the kid didn't get it. He couldn't possibly understand what it had taken Hicks a lifetime of eating shit to learn. Starting fresh, hitting the road with nothing, is only exciting when you're young. But after starting from scratch again and again, after having nothing for so long, Hicks knew it wouldn't work. Not in the long run. Not this time. This time. It was for keeps. Until the road runs out. Right? This was a shot. He was going to do it right. And that included getting the money. They've said that hope is free. That it didn't cost anything to have faith. It's all bullshit, of course. Hicks knew they were full of it. Whoever they were. And that hope was plenty expensive. A clean start. Safe home, doctors, all the operations, the life that Dakota wanted, that he deserved. Hicks tallied these mounting aspirations in his mind's ledger. A better tomorrow costs money. There was a whole lot of hope in the gutter. Hicks had spent enough time there to know. Go back and start the car, he said. Be ready. Hicks grabbed the bag, got up and moved into the darkness before Dakota could say anything else. He knew that if he gave himself half a chance, he'd stay. He'd give in, and they'd leave with nothing. He walked fast, making his way around the edge of the firelight and staying behind the cars when he could. Dakota's scared, pretty eyes burned in his mind, and the shrieks of the maniacs rang in his ears. Just one more bad thing, Hicks told himself. 
Just be that guy one more time. And you'll have the rest of your life. Your real life. And it starts today. To get over it. Better men have done worse things. Hicks reached the Durango and opened the door without being seen. He found the suitcase in the back seat, just like Georgie'd said he would. He opened it and began stacking packs of bills into the duffel bag beside the guns. Every squeal and scream from the fire made him jump. When he was finally done, he started back. About fifteen feet from the SUV, something struck the ground to his left. The head. A wild kick had sent the dusty, severed head flying high, arcing through the air to land, bounce, and roll to a stop right next to him. The colt was quiet as all eighteen of their hollow eyes turned and stared at him in unison. Hicks leveled the shotgun. The death heads fanned out and began to approach. Hicks thought of ordering them back and dismissed it. Even if they understood, they really wouldn't care about his threats. They loved death. What other threat could he offer? He tucked the shotgun under his arm and drew two pistols from his jacket pockets. The death heads were closing in fast, clawing their own flesh with sharp, dirty fingernails, working themselves up into a frenzy of bloodlust. Hicks opened fire. A tall, bald man on his far left took the first shot in the chest and went down quick. On his right, Hicks managed to hit a woman in the shoulder. She spun around and fell, but kept crawling toward him. His second shot found her head. Hicks kept shooting as he backed toward the Durango. The seven left were spread further out now, flanking him in the darkness like Halloween decorations come to life. He kept shooting at the four he could see. Reaching the car, Hicks dropped the bag of money and the shotgun by his feet. He rested against the vehicle and sighted a man with a grisly beard. The first shot hit his chest. The second hit his neck. Hicks moved on instantly to a young girl nearing him on his right. She was close. He could smell her. The reek of shit, blood, and vomit made his eyes water. He pulled the trigger and the gun clicked empty. He tossed it. Tried the other one. Same story. He reached down and came up with the shotgun just as she lunged, emptying both barrels into her stomach and cutting her in half in mid-air. Splattered with a warm rain of blood and guts, Hicks dropped the empty shotgun and pulled another pistol from the bag. The only sound as he scanned the dark was the crackling of the fire. Pain erupted in his shoulder, and Hicks screamed. From the roof of the Durango, a young boy wearing a necklace of bones raised a long wooden spear and plunged it down again. Hicks tried to duck, but the spear sank into his back. He stepped away and shot the boy, saw him fall silently from the roof. Suddenly, he was knocked to the ground. The spear fell from his back and the wind rushed from his lungs. A big man loomed over him, brandishing a machete. Hicks raised the pistol but the lunatic brought the large blade down onto the back of his hand. Several of his fingers fell away cleanly, and Hicks saw himself drop the gun. With a shrill cry mismatched to his size, the man raised the blade high above his head. Hicks, half blind with pain and struggling to breathe, kicked as hard as he could up towards the man's dangling genitals. The big man doubled over, clutching himself, as Hicks rolled out of reach. Getting shakily to his feet, Hicks saw the other three coming closer. Two women and a man with his long hair slicked back and shiny with fresh blood. Hicks reached into his boot and pulled out his hunting knife, tucking his wounded hand close to his chest. A sound erupted from the far side of the fire then. One Hicks knew well. Two bright spotlights grew large in the dark as Hicks' car burst over the hillside flying through the air like a V8-powered magic carpet. The Mustang came down hard and clipped the seated corpse idol. It sailed into the fire, chair and all, as the car skidded to a stop, flinging dust and gravel. Hicks smiled as he saw Dakota at the wheel, looking mad as hell. 
He leapt out, blasting away with a sawed-off pump action like he'd been born to do it. The girl scattered, and the long-haired man scurried behind a nearby pickup. The big man with the machete, though, having recovered from the shot he'd taken to the balls, ran straight at Hicks. Dakota, too far away to shoot without hitting Hicks, watched him and the man with the machete meet in a bone-snapping collision. The big man landed on top of Hicks, who thrust his blade desperately up, gouging into the lunatic's left eye. Distantly, he felt the rusty blade of the machete push deep into his stomach, an enormous pressure crushing his neck. His vision failing, Hicks tore his knife free from the big man's eye socket and stabbed it into the side of his neck, pulling as hard as he could. The Death Head's throat ripped apart like a soggy garbage bag, spilling blood and stringy bits of muscle and flesh down onto Hicks's face. Still, the maniac squeezed harder at his throat and pushed the machete up deeper into Hicks's belly. It felt like the tip was in his chest, poking a lung. Every breath was agony. The handle jutted out from the mouth of his laughing devil tattoo like a strange black tongue. Dakota appeared above them suddenly and emptied a small twenty-two pistol into the big man's back. The maniac finally slumped over and was still, and Hicks fell into blackness. The screech of jamming gears roused Hicks. He forced his eyes open and saw the world rushing past outside the car. His hands were heavy in his lap, one wrapped in a stained sweatshirt and throbbing. A sticky, warm puddle squished beneath his ass as he tried to sit up. Pain, indescribable pain, pushed him back down. Hold on! Dakota yelled, tears streaming from his eyes. His foot slammed the gas pedal to the floor. Hold on, Hicks! Hicks tried to speak, but found his tongue was too heavy. He blinked hard and saw the blue bag at his feet. Feet. He could not move, spilling over with cash. The kid would be okay. He could be anything he wanted now, whoever he wanted to be. In countless mirror and window reflections over the years to come, that sly, sexy, beautiful smile would be Hicks's memorial. On whatever face the kid chose, beneath any hair, that smile would sit resolutely below those wonderful, sparkly eyes. Just for him. Not a bad legacy, Hicks thought. Better men have checked out with less. And where was Georgie? Only Waffle stared back at him from the back seat, ambivalent, as if he were not surprised by these recent grim developments. Hicks decided that he didn't care. It was getting hard to focus. He threw up and spit and blood spilled down over his chest. It pulled in his lap on the already sodden blanket that was wrapped tightly around him like a big plaid bandage. You just hold on, Dakota said. Just hold on, all the way, remember? Till the road was out. But the road was ending. Dakota couldn't see it yet, but Hicks could. A large, black tunnel... It was approaching just up ahead, swallowing the horizon. They were speeding right toward it. Hicks saw the sun rising behind them in the side mirror. They were driving west. If you drive west fast enough, even at dawn, Hicks thought, it's like you're driving into the past, back into yesterday. Hicks didn't care for yesterday much, not any of the many yesterdays he'd known. He wished he could have been born later. Ten, maybe twenty years from now. Maybe the world of tomorrow would have been his time. He'd been too early. And now, it was way too late. But maybe that's what it would take. Maybe he was the kind of guy that fueled the machines of progress. The pain flowed out of him then, sudden as a blink, and with it, the regret. It was silly to regret. 
He'd had his shot, after all. The world doesn't care if you're in love. It doesn't care about your regrets or your promises. It doesn't owe you anything. The world is full of monsters. They grow out of slinking under beds and crouching in closets, and they get worse. Once upon a time, a little boy named Gavin Hicks had thought you could beat those monsters if you were tough enough. If you made yourself scary enough. So he bloodied his knuckles, and sharpened his tongue, and cultivated a good glare and big, hate-filled muscles. He'd injected an armor of ink beneath his scar-covered flesh to hide the cracks. And it had worked. For a while. But he'd learned too late that grown-up monsters don't fight like that. They're carved of brick and steel, made of disappointment and regret, and they are relentless. In order to take down those monsters, you have to have the right ammo. You've got to be very quick. There are no second chances, none that ever really count, and it's not fair. But in the world of grown-up monsters, hate is a half-measure. And even love is most often a bullet of insufficient caliber. Maybe tomorrow would be enough. Hicks had time to hope. Quickly. Just before the darkness got too deep. That it would. Dakota was shouting. It sounded faint and so... So far away... They drove into the tunnel. And there was nothing but cool darkness and the lulling pulse of the engine. A few days ago, I was attending college to become a funeral director. Yeah, I know. I'm a weirdo. Yada, yada, yada. I've heard this from nearly everyone who asks what I'm going to school for. I understand the assumptions that come with this trade. But I wanted to help people in one of the most difficult times of their lives. I wanted to lend an ear to the grieving, and I wanted to show respect to the dead by helping the loved ones they left behind. It is kind of creepy. But death gives me a sort of calm. Death has never scared me. Until a few days ago. I'm nearing the completion of my degree, and I've already been accepted as an apprentice at a local funeral home that I will not name. I don't want any negativity to be pointed at them. It's not their fault. But, something really strange has happened. It has shook me so much that I don't know what direction I'm going to take my career. So, as a funeral home apprentice, you really just clean. A lot. I would get to shadow my mentor when he would meet with family members to go over the actual arrangement processes casket choices, cremation, etc. But again, my days normally involve dusting, vacuuming, and cleaning the morgue area. I'm a little morbid, I guess, because the morgue and preparation area does not bother me in the slightest. Mopping up bodily fluids and embalming fluid was just another day at work for me. My mentor always complimented this quality and joked that he hoped nothing followed me home. This never bothered me, but... Maybe I should have taken it a little more seriously. Mr. Mason's body arrived at our funeral home on April 24th, 2017. It was a Monday, and after a few morning classes, I arrived at the funeral home around noon. I walked into the side entrance of the building with my purse on one arm and a sub sandwich in my opposite hand. I walked down to the morgue as there were lockers down there for the few employees to put their personal belongings in. I was going to take this time to hurriedly finish my sandwich and then see what my mentor had lined out for the day. As soon as I opened the locker and it let out a quiet metallic creak, 
My mentor called my name from the morgue. I let out a small sigh and headed in that direction with my sandwich still in my hand. I had just taken a huge bite before entering the room and I was trying to chew as quickly as humanly possible. But when I saw the body on the preparation table, I stopped moving and even stopped breathing for a few moments. I looked up and met the smiling face of my mentor. Today I'm going to give you a quick run through of embalming. I finally swallowed the bite of sandwich I had in my mouth and tossed the rest of my lunch into the trash can at the entrance of the room. I nodded and gave a meek smile, but I kept my eyes on the body on the table. Now, this person didn't suffer a violent death or anything. The man on the table was not horribly disfigured or unrecognizable. Trust me, the gunshot victims we've gotten are awful and very sad. Or the worst was a kid who'd been hit by a car. This client was just a very elderly man who I only could assume expired due to natural causes. As I stated, he was very old and frail. A white cloth was laid over the bottom part of his body for what I hope is obvious reasons. His upper body showed extreme signs of age. Dry, wrinkled skin riddled with age spots made up a majority of his complexion. He was very thin and maybe weighed a hundred pounds soaking wet. Along his side, I could see a large bruised area that was due to blood pooling, which led me to believe he had passed while in a position on his side. His face was skeletal, with deep-set eyes along jutting temples and cheekbones. The skin on his face looked so thin, I thought his cheekbones might rip through the skin if the smallest amount of pressure was applied. He was completely bald, other than a few wisps of hair scattered at random on his scalp. His eyebrows were so light that he almost looked alien. The most unnerving thing was his mouth. It wasn't in a horror movie toothy grin or a gaping maw. It was more of a grimace. His lips were pulled up and he seemed to be clenching his teeth almost in a snarl. His gums were nearly white, and his teeth seemed too large for his gaunt, thin face. His teeth had a brownish-yellowish tint often seen in cigarette smokers and very heavy coffee drinkers. His eyes were, thankfully, closed. But I knew the eyes that peered at me from under those eyelids were blank, and by now had a milky film over them. Poor old thing lived alone, other than a caretaker that would stop by every day. He was wheelchair-bound and had a heart attack. The caretaker found him on the floor as he was trying to crawl towards the phone to call for help. My mentor sympathized while preparing the embalming fluid IV. The rest of the day was quiet. After the embalming lesson, I forgot about Mr. Mason after he was secured in his unit in the morgue. I really hoped his funeral would be on a day I was off. I just couldn't get over the strange expression on his face. I understand the events surrounding his death were tragic, but why were his lips completely tucked under themselves like that? I shuddered as I contemplated this while walking to my car. I stopped close to my car and sighed as I realized my keys were likely at the bottom of my purse. I started digging through my purse frantically as I thought, whoever thought that women should start carrying purses is stupid. I then stopped moving and turned to look behind me. I had heard someone right near my ear whisper my name. I was expecting to see my mentor pulling a prank. Honestly, any human standing there would have been comforting. But to see nothing made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. My hands touched my keys and I must have clicked the unlock button on the fob 20 times as I sped walked the rest of the way to my car. I threw my purse in the passenger seat nearly left in the driver's seat, slammed my car door and pressed the lock button three times for good measure. I started my car and glanced in the rearview mirror to prepare to back up and get the hell out of there. As my eyes grazed over the rearview mirror, I saw a shadow in the back seat. My head spun around to peer into the back seat and I was once again met with nothing. I let out a big relieved sigh and started to chuckle. I think I need to take a day off. 
My drive home that evening, although feverish, went well, and I arrived at my house without any more strange occurrences. The evening's events had me so shook up, I couldn't even enjoy a shower. I felt like a kid who watched a horror movie while their parents were out to dinner. I would start to put my head under the running water, and just as I would close my eyes, I would hear a noise, and quickly peer out of the shower curtain to find nothing but my dog laying just outside the bathroom door. He was guarding me as he had done from the day I brought him home. Angus was my shadow, my big 70-pound shadow. He met my gaze and wagged his tail and it lightly tapped the floor. I got out of the shower after being interrupted by my own paranoia every few minutes. I walked to my bedroom and only turned off the lights as I passed by the switches, but I left the kitchen light on for good measure. I spun around quickly when I heard Angus let out a low growl from behind me. He was peering back into the kitchen and was backing up slowly towards me while still letting a growl escape his meaty jowls with each step. I walked towards the frame of the door and he followed close behind with his head low and emitting a growl. What is it, buddy? I asked in a barely audible whisper. He ran into the kitchen barking. I almost tripped as he ran by me and I sighed as I saw a mouse run under the stove. I had a few from time to time and made a mental note to get glue traps the next time I was at the store. Come on, let's go to bed. You scared the crap out of me, I said chuckling as I patted Angus on his wrinkled head. I woke up a few minutes before my alarm in a cold sweat. The dream I had had Mr. Mason's dead shriveled face in it. It was just like a gif image of him opening and closing his mouth as if gasping for his last few breaths. His eyes were deep-set and milky white, and his lips were still stuck underneath themselves. Inside of his mouth was a dry black tongue that waved back and forth as he continued to gasp. It was hypnotizing, and then he stopped and just stared at me with those dead, silvery eyes. I swung my legs over the side of my bed and continued to heave in deep breaths. I felt like I was suffocating but I knew it was just a small panic attack and it would pass. I had these in normal day life outside of terrifying dreams. So I just focused on my breathing, put my hands over my eyes as I sat on my knees on the side of my bed. I decided it best to not dwell on what had happened and continue with my normal routine. As I was walking out my door, I saw a strange stain on my carpet by the entryway. It was a black stain with just a tinge of red it almost looked like old blood. I shrugged it off and thought I had something on my shoes the night before and didn't notice. I would clean it up when I got home. The drive to work was unnerving. I had assisted with many funerals before and had a few very tragic mangled clients. But Mr. Mason was just stuck in my head. I just didn't know why. The day at work went pretty quickly. I only had one strange experience. I was in the morgue area alone, working on a little old lady who had passed away from natural causes. I was finishing up her makeup with no supervision when I heard a sound come from the area we put the bodies. I froze and listened. I could hear a scraping noise and what sounded like a haggard breath. All at once it stopped, and I chalked it up to my mind playing tricks on me. It scared me to death, but with no more events occurring for the rest of the day, what could I say it was? That Mr. Mason was alive in his refrigerated tomb? I didn't mention it to my mentor, but asked if I could take a personal day the following day. I hate to say I lied about why, but I did. I blamed it on a paper at school, and my mentor happily obliged. On the way home, I stopped and grabbed some much-needed beer and headed home to relax. I just wanted to forget about Mr. Mason and move on with my life. I sunk into the bubble-filled tub and deeply inhaled the lavender-scented steam emanating from the water. I pulled a bubbly hand from under the water and brought the cold beer bottle to my lips. I sighed and laid my head back and closed my eyes. Angus was at his usual post, laying with his head down between his paws. Then I heard Angus growl. My eyes shot open and then I chalked it up to another mouse. I told him to leave it, but he kept growling. 
Then he stopped and let out a nervous whimper. Now this freaked me out. I jumped out of the tub and threw a towel around my soap-riddled body and started walking to the door of the bathroom. Angus had been slowly backing himself into the bathroom, whimpering still. I paused the music that was playing from my phone and quietly shushed Angus. I heard a weird scraping sound that I just couldn't place. It sounded like something being dragged across the floor. I peered out of the door of the bathroom and my jaw dropped. I rubbed my eyes and looked into the dining room again. Coming into the light from the kitchen was a figure on the floor. As the kitchen light hit it, my mind finally realized what the sound was. Mr. Mason was dragging himself across the floor. I know, I know that's impossible, but I'm telling you what I saw. I'd only drank half a beer, so I couldn't blame it for what I was seeing. There he was, his mouth leaking a dark blackish red liquid. He would reach out with his skeletal arm and pull his body forward and then repeat. His lips were still curled under themselves and his milky eyes were open very wide. I pulled Angus into the bathroom and locked the door and stepped back. I could still hear the dragging sound and it soon stopped outside the bathroom door. I could hear him gasping for breath and then I heard a scratching on the bathroom door. I could imagine his long, thin fingers slowly traveling down the wooden door. Angus was whimpering and backed up to me to get as far away from the door as possible. Between the breaths, I could hear words, but I couldn't quite make them out. Please, leave me alone, I murmured between my short, panicked breaths. I leaned into the door and listened. A breathy, gurgled voice was coming from the other side. It took a few times, but I finally made out what he was saying. Not alone. He just continued to say it over and over. I put my hands over my ears and slid down the door and started to cry, Leave me alone! I started to yell. I don't know how long I sat in the bathroom, my hands over my ears, but I noticed that it was suddenly eerily quiet. Angus nuzzled his nose into my hand, and I gingerly rubbed his head. I opened the door just to crack while holding back tears and was met with nothing. I started to breathe heavy and almost started to hyperventilate. I was relieved, but I suddenly felt like I was having a panic attack. I closed my eyes and started to count down from 10, only focusing on my breathing. And after a few seconds, my breathing started to slow. I got dressed and ran to my bedroom with Angus trailing me. As soon as we were both in, I slammed the door and locked it. I kept the light on and turned on the TV to hopefully drown out any noise. I woke up not sure when or how I fell asleep and my room was dark. The light and TV were both off. Angus was standing up and was almost standing on my head, and he was growling. Then I heard it. That deep, rattling breath. Then the scraping sound. I sat up and started to go for the lamp on my nightstand when in the darkness I saw the outline of a thin, long arm rise up from the foot of my bed. I started to panic. I wanted to run, but my body wouldn't move. The phrase frozen with fear is a real thing. I wanted nothing more than to stand up, jump to the foot of my bed, and leave the house, but I couldn't. The arm had lingered in the air for several seconds when it suddenly shot down and grabbed my ankle. I started to pull away, but the thin hand felt like it was cutting into my leg. The second hand followed the same motion. As soon as the second hand touched me, I felt my body contort. My head shot back deeply into my pillow and my chest rose upwards, putting me into somewhat of a backbend position. Then a memory started to play in my mind. I felt like I was watching a movie. It was a little hazy and I saw Mr. Mason sitting in his wheelchair watching the news. He was obviously in poor health, but he was very alive. He wasn't scary. He was just a frail old man. Suddenly, he grabbed his chest and fell to the floor and started to seize and gasp for breath. He started to crawl over towards the phone, which was on the other side of the living room, and was a rotary phone to show his age. 
The front door opened and a woman in scrubs entered. His aide. And instead of doing what you would expect and run to his side and help him or call 911, she, she just stood there. He was gurgling out, Help me! Over and over and she just stood there. She was watching him die. She walked over to him and sat in the chair that was facing him and started to laugh. The lady who was supposed to care for people was watching him die and was enjoying it. Help him! I started yelling in my head knowing that this was a vision of sorts and my actions couldn't change the present. His aide got up from the chair, grabbed him by his frail frame and drug him further away from the phone. She laughed and sat back down in the chair. Mr. Mason looked directly at me and shortly after his eyes went glassy and I knew he had passed. I came back to reality and the tears were streaming down my face. I could feel the hands around my ankles but the grip had loosened. I sat up and leaned over and put my hand over the thin skeletal hand that held my right ankle. I am so sorry, I repeated through tears. I felt the other hand leave my left ankle and set gently over my hand. Thank you, a breathy voice answered. I woke up to the sun shining into my window and I felt like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders. Mr. Mason just wanted someone to know that he didn't die alone. He wanted someone to know that his death was not peaceful and quiet. He wanted someone to know his suffering. I called my mentor and told him that a family emergency had come up and I had to move back home, several hours away from St. Louis, and I wouldn't be able to continue school right now. He tried to make arrangements for me, but I declined. I knew I had found a new calling. Even if I couldn't change what happened, spirits wanted someone to hear them and I was one of those people. I contacted the aid agency I had saw on the lady's scrub in the memory. And it didn't take much to find out everything about her thanks to social media. I wrote a note and put it into her mailbox. It was short and sweet and only said two words. I know. I figured that the paranoia would be better than her going to jail. And I'd like to think that Mr. Mason thinks so too, as I haven't saw him since that night. I have a new calling. And although it's scary, I have to use this gift. I'm writing this in the middle of the night and I hear a faint knocking on my bedroom door. I think I have a new client. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.
tales for dark nights.